All right. Howdy. <laughs> thank you all for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, students and parents, um, everybody, thank you. Welcome to our 2023 NASA Downlink event. Today, uh, the students here in the front row will get a chance to have their questions answered from two astronauts, Frank Rubio and Jasmine Mogbelli, who are currently 250 miles above us uh, on the International Space Station. Uh, on behalf of the South Texas Astronomical Society, sorry, my name is Victor De Los Santos. I'm the executive director for the South Texas Astronomical Society. Uh, on behalf of our organization, we'd like to thank the Brownsville Independent School District for allowing us to host our event here, and uh, NASA, of course, for giving us this amazing opportunity. So let's give our students a quick round of applause for their curiosity. All right, so. As you all know, astronauts' time in space is very precious. And NASA has given us uh, 20 minutes that this downlink is going to happen. The downlink is scheduled for 9.05. So what's going to happen now is I'm going to switch the stream over to NASA Live. And we're going to wait just a few minutes uh, for the downlink to get started. Thank you. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. We are ready for the event. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. How do you have us? Hello and good morning from all of us here at home on Earth. Today, we are speaking to you from Brazil, Texas. My name is Jacqueline Peña, and I am an ambassador for the South Texas Astronomical Society. Our mission is to ignite curiosity through space science and STEM, and today we will accomplish exactly that by connecting our students to astronauts aboard the International Space Station and asking a few questions. We would like to thank NASA for giving our community this amazing opportunity, and NASA astronauts Frank Rubio and Jasmine McBelly for sharing your time with us today. Now, on to our first question. Hi, my name is Caitlin. My question is, from your experience working on the International Space Station, what features would you like to add to future space stations like the Gateway? Hey, Caitlin, and to all the members of the South Texas Astronomical Society, welcome to the International Space Station. Uh, it's great to be uh, hanging out with you guys today and teach you a little bit about space and the International Space Station. Uh, you know, so I think one, we have a pretty awesome station, and they, they did an amazing job engineering this uh, thing and putting it together up here at 250 miles above the surface of the Earth. Um, but I think I would love to have a window that looks uh, zenith or above us. Uh, so our beautiful window, the cupola that we have, currently looks down on the Earth, which is pretty awesome because it is probably the most beautiful thing we see up here. But I think, uh, especially at night, at night, it would be awesome to have a window overhead where we could just uh, gaze at the stars. Uh, that would be one of the main things I would add. I would also add another bathroom because as we get more and more people up here, it does get a little bit crowded. And if at all possible, it would be awesome to add a shower to the ISS. Uh, when you're up here for six months or even a year, that's a long time to go without a shower. We do stay very clean, but it wouldn't be nice to have running water every once in a while. Hi, my name is Mazalia, and my question is, what do you remember thinking the first time you were on a spacewalk? Hey, Medallia. Actually, you know what? I'll take that question, too, uh, because Jasmine is going to do a spacewalk here soon, but she hasn't been on one yet. Uh, but I know she's going to do awesome when she's out there. Um, and I'll tell you, the, the most beautiful thing was the view that you get when you're on a spacewalk. And that's because the windows are pretty cool up here. But um, because of the way that we have to protect them, you do have even, um, even though you have a 360 view, it's a little bit limited by the structural elements that hold the, hold the window panes in place. But when you're out on a spacewalk, your helmet 
has wider view than your peripheral vision. And so you feel like you're looking at the earth and looking at the heavens with just your plain eyes. And it's just magnificent how it all looks. Um, so that was pretty amazing. The other really cool thing that I really enjoyed was just the team that came together to put the spacewalk, uh, to plan it, um, and put it all together and put all the products together. Hundreds of people pitch in. And then we go out and do probably the most challenging thing that we do. And watching that whole team come together is pretty remarkable. Hi, my name is Paola. And my question is, do you think that animals will ever be able to cohabitate alongside humans in space? Hi, Paola. So actually, before we put humans in space, um, we did put other animals in space. The US uh, flew some monkeys to space. Russia flew some dogs. Um, but now living here on the space station, I'm trying to think about my family uh, back home. We usually have uh, dogs as pets. And I'm thinking about uh, a dog living up here with us. And uh, I think they might have a hard time. They might not be able to hang on to the handrails, but I think we could make some uh, provisions for them uh, and, and adapt a bit the structure inside here. And uh, I, I think we could uh, cohabitate with animals. My name is George, and my question is, out of all the mechanical noises in the space station, which is your favorite? George, that's a that's a good one. So I'd have to say something that's hopefully constantly a background noise up here is the the ventilation running. So, you know, if we don't have that uh, that going, then the air just stagnates and you get pockets of CO2 and things like that. And so it's it becomes uh, a noise that you just become used to and it's kind of like white noise but it's very noticeable when that sound of the fans goes off and it usually means uh, something's not quite right so i'd have to say that's my favorite sound hi my name's peter my question is how scary is it to be on a rocket hey peter well, you know what? Um, it's actually pretty cool. It wasn't very scary at all. Uh, the cool thing is that Jasmine came up on a Dragon uh, spacecraft. I came up on a Soyuz. Uh, so two totally different rockets. Uh, but I think we both felt the same. The cool thing is that we trained for this mission for almost two years. And constantly during that time, you're practicing what to do if things go wrong. And so all you ever do is practice emergencies, time after time after time, because it's really critical that you do the exact right thing if those things were to happen. But on the day that you launch, everything goes perfectly. Uh, and so it's actually pretty chill because nothing's going wrong compared to all the simulations that you've done up until that point. Uh, the other thing is that you're so focused on making sure that um, all the right things are going on and reading your instruments and making sure that the rocket is healthy um, that you really don't have a lot of time to think about what's actually going on and how much rocket fuel you're sitting on top of and the fact that you're uh, speeding up from zero to almost 15,000 miles per hour. All that stuff's pretty cool, but the reality is most of us are pretty focused on what's going on and it's not till after we get to space that we actually think about, wow, that was pretty amazing. Hi, my name is Victor and my question is, do microgravity affect your perception of time? Hi, Victor. Um, so speaking of time, up here, um, you know, the International Space Station goes around the Earth 16 times a day. It's traveling 17,500 miles per hour. So inside, you know, when we're back home on Earth, we use light. The, the sun and the night kind of sets our circadian rhythm and tells our bodies when we should be waking up and when we should be going to sleep. Um, up here, we don't have that because we're going in and out of uh, at every 90 minutes. So um, up here, we actually kind of use the lights inside the International Space Station. We turn them on bright during the day and uh, dim them or turn them off uh, at night to kind of set our time uh, inside our bodies. Hi, my name is Aldo. And my question is, how would you relate your experience in the Air Force to that of being an astronaut? 
Hey, Aldo. Well, both Jasmine and I are in the military, uh, but neither of us are Air Force. Uh, Jasmine's a Marine. I'm, I'm in the Army. Um, but all of the military um, forces provide astronauts uh, to NASA, and they've done so since the beginning of the space program. Um, the cool thing is that when we work for NASA, we really focus on the science and on the outreach uh, for human space exploration. But I think the military does prepare you in some really uh, good ways. One is the fact that you're part of a team, a really amazing team. Uh, and just like in the Army or the Marine Corps, uh, here at NASA we have amazing people around us that really make the mission happen. And so that's probably the most gratifying thing about it. Uh, but the other thing that I think is really important for most of us is that you're contributing to something that's bigger than yourself, uh, and you really feel like you have a purpose, which for us here is to say, hey, uh, we can send humans to space. We've been up here for 23 years, and soon we're going to be going back to the moon and eventually over to Mars. And we know that everything that we do here is contributing to that long-term mission. And so that's a pretty cool uh, sense of satisfaction to know that we're contributing to something that's bigger than ourselves. Hi, my name is Jorge, and my question is, are there any specific songs or albums that hold a special meaning for you in relation to you and your astronaut career? Hi, Jorge. So it's funny, when I think back uh, to my time in the military, each deployment is defined by the songs I listen to on it. And when I hear certain songs, it takes me back to, to those, uh, those deployments. Up here, I, I've only been up here a week, so uh, you know, I don't have uh, a whole album or anything specific, but actually I was working out the other day, and Frank's probably going to laugh at me for this one, but the song A Whole New World came on from Aladdin. Uh, I don't know if uh, you're old enough to have seen uh, Aladdin, but, you know, my name's Jasmine, like Princess Jasmine, so when I was in elementary school and Aladdin came out, people would always sing A Whole New World to me, and I thought the words were really fitting. One in Aladdin when they're, uh, that song is uh, being sung, they're on a magic carpet flying around. And here in space, I like love floating through the different modules and I feel kind of like a superhero flying around. A and then second, just the, the words, a whole new world. And, and from up here, you know, looking back on Earth, it, it's totally changed my perspective and it does feel like a whole new world. So. Uh, I'd have to say that song was one that uh, really stuck out to me when I was working out the other day, and I've listened to a few times since then. Hi, my name is Andrea, and my question is, what experiments are conducted on the International Space Station to learn more about living in space? Hey, Andrea. Well, I'm still seeing a whole new world in my head. <laughs> so, uh, no, you know, like I said, one of the, the, the key things that we do up here as, as astronauts is see how humans respond to space. So a lot of the science focuses on us. Uh, we're doing simple things like, hey, how does eating a different type of diet affect your performance in space? Uh, we also do a lot of medical procedures like ultrasounds of our eyes. Uh, in our different uh, blood vessels because we want to see how being living uh, up here in space for six to 12 months uh, affects those systems. Uh, but then we also do some really cool things on things like combustion, right? So in space, um, without gravity, uh, you also don't have uh, the movement of essentially more dense and less dense particles uh, as they heat up, right? And so convection that happens on Earth doesn't really happen here in space. And that's really important for things like uh, fuel, right? And especially rocket fuel, because we want those things to work up here. So we study things like that, and we see how uh, combustion happens. Uh, you know, if you light a candle in space, uh, it actually doesn't form that little uh, tip, because, uh, again, there's no convection happening. And so it actually forms a little sphere. Uh, we don't get to light candles because uh, it's a fire hazard, but we've seen videos of the, some of the science experiments that happen up here. Uh, so all those things will help us not just to live on the, on the space station, but uh, live eventually over in the moon and eventually in Mars, which will be pretty cool. Hi, my name is Lane, and my question is, how often do you do math on the International Space Station? Lynn, so you're probably wondering if, uh, if the math is really worth it. So actually, every day, not necessarily sitting down with a pencil and paper doing math, but 
even just getting around the space station, you know, if I, if I want to go a certain direction, uh, I have to like put that force through my center of gravity to go that way. And then, oh no, I grabbed on here, but my center of gravity is offset, so I rotate. And so every single time we're just moving around the space station, we're using math and physics to figure out how I should, uh, you know, input a, a moment or a translational force. And the other day I had to move a big object through the space station. I had to think about not just my center of gravity, but now me with this object and that center of gravity. And so I think we're kind of constantly doing math up here and sometimes for the different experiments, we need to use those skills as well. So it's, a, it's basically a daily, daily thing. Hi, my name is Viviana, and my question is, in your opinion and experience, how important is it to see diverse representation lead the frontier of space exploration? Hey, Viviana. Well, you know what? I think it's really important, uh, but I think it's equally as important to pick the most qualified people out there. And that's because this is a really tough mission. And so you want to make sure that everyone that does this mission is incredibly uh, capable and able to handle it. But the cool thing is, uh, and unfor I don't really like to talk about accomplishments because, uh, you know, I don't want to sound boastful. But in this case, you know, uh, Jasmine graduated from MIT. Uh, she's a Cobra pilot. Uh, she's a Marine test pilot. Um, I, like I said, I, I've been in the Army for uh, 20 plus years. I started off as a Black Hawk pilot. Um, I then became a medical doctor, and I've uh, worked with special forces and lots of other things. But the cool thing is, the reality is, if you pick the most qualified people now in our country, you're going to have great gender representation, you're going to have great representation uh, from different ethnic backgrounds, uh, and we're going to look like America because a lot of highly qualified people are out there. So hopefully you guys will keep hitting the books. And someday, we're going to be sitting there looking at you guys and thinking, wow, they are so incredibly qualified and way more qualified than we were ever. Uh, so we look forward to seeing what your generation has to offer. Hi, my name is Santiago. And my question is, how would you explain the International Space Station's protection from radiation to a fifth grader? Hi, Santiago. So. In terms of on the International Space Station and our protection from radiation, you know, there are lots of different types of radiation. And um, thankfully, we're in low Earth orbit, so we're still inside the Van Allen belt. So the Earth's magnetic field um, protects us from a lot of the radiation. We also have the structure of the space station around us. And if there are times, you know, when we track a specific event coming, like uh, solar high activity solar flare event or something we can also use uh, additional things like just water you know we regenerate a lot of our own water so that's a resource we could use to to create additional barriers to help protect us um, obviously once we start going uh, further uh, in the solar system and and past the van allen bent belt we'll have to uh consider more things to protect us from radiation and that's why a lot of uh, the missions that go up for example artemis one had uh some you know mannequins on it or models that were carrying uh, sensors in the torso to detect a lot of the radiation so that we can be prepared for those missions as we go further hi my name is Nadalia, and my question is what happens if someone gets sick on the space station? Hi, Mandalia. Yeah, Jasmine's tapping my shoulder uh, because as a doctor, I'm, I'm currently acting as the chief medical officer, but there's not always a doctor on board. And so we all go through medical training, and uh, including Jasmine. So if I were to get sick, she would be taking care of me. Um, and so we all get a basic uh, amount of medical training. Uh, but the, the best thing is that we all stay pretty healthy. We all stay in pretty good shape. Uh, and so that helps us uh, really not get sick up here. The other thing we do is we use quarantine, right, which now after COVID we're all familiar with. Uh, but we've been doing that uh, since humans have been living in space. And that's because, uh, so we basically spend two weeks before our launch isolated from other people. And that's because we don't want to bring any new viruses. Uh, we don't want to be sick when we fly up here. Uh, and generally, you're only exposed to six other humans while you're on the station. Uh, so there's just not a whole lot of viruses up here to get you sick. 
Uh, the one thing that can throw you off, though, uh, as Jasmine said, is your vestibular system, right? So you can get a little sick uh, the first few days you get here. And if you think about it, right, if I jump up here, um, if I did this on Earth and I started standing like this, my brain would really uh, just not be able to handle it. And so the first couple days when you're up here and you're doing that a lot, it really throws you off and a lot of, a lot of people uh, get nauseous and some people throw up. Uh, but we have medicine for all that and within a few days you adapt uh, and, and then it feels perfectly normal. Hi, my name is Caitlin. My question is, can you describe your most awe-inspiring or memorable moment during your time in space? Sure, Caitlin, that's a, that's a great question. It's, you know, this is my first week in space, so I have a, a lot of things are coming to mind, but um, I'll, I'll mention kind of two. The first one I'll mention is when we first got to space station, you know, it seemed very busy at first and a bit disorienting. As Frank described, I was looking at things from a totally different perspective than I had before, and I, after training hundreds of hours in these modules, couldn't even tell where I was because now the ceiling was the floor and, and vice versa. Um, but Andy finally pulled me over. He, you know, he's done a mission to the space station before and he was like, have you gone to the cupola yet? And I was like, no, I haven't. And he took me to the cupola, which is our, you know, earth facing uh, window. And he opened the shutters and you know, it was just an amazing view, not just of Earth and our beautiful planet, but also seeing the International Space Station. Um, and it's just a, such a marvel, this thing we've constructed in space. And then the, the second one I'll say was right after uh, second engine cutoff, you know, you suddenly are in weightlessness. And I've, I felt like I was just hanging upside down from my restraints. Um, and so at first I was like, okay, this just feels a little uncomfortable actually. And then finally it was time for us to get out of our seats and I unbuckled and that was my first experience uh, floating. Uh, and that was just incredible. And I also broke out some of my candy coated peanuts. <laughs> Frank, would you like, uh, would you like some? Sure. All right, let's, I'll have you hold that. We get to play with our food in space. And almost every day we get to play with our food, which is kind of one of the cool things of being an astronaut. Howdy, my name's Colonel Mike Fossum. I'm a retired astronaut now, but I spent 194 days in space during my three missions to the International Space Station. This brings back a lot of memories. I really want to thank NASA and the astronauts on board the space station today for bringing this opportunity to the Valley through the South Texas Astronomical Society. I also want to thank Victor De Los Santos for your efforts to lead this group and inspire today's youth. I grew up in McAllen, down on the border with the rest of you. I dreamed about flying in space when I watched Apollo 11 put the first footprints on the moon. People laughed, people said I was crazy. And part of me gave up on even believing the dream was possible, but I never completely gave up. I had teachers and friends and family who believed in me and supported me, supported me to go to college and the opportunities beyond continuing to lean forward until it finally came true. I pray that you will continue, you will believe in your dreams and you will reach every day toward striving to achieve those dreams. If you believe it and you're willing to work hard enough for it every single day, you can do amazing things. Thanks again for a great day. Thanks so much, Mike, and thank you all to the members of STARS. Uh, keep studying and keep uh, working towards your dreams. Take care. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants.
Well, that was pretty cool, right? <laughs> Let's give it up to our students for asking them awesome questions again. Jorge Hernandez from Dell Middle School. I'm Victor Martinez from Pullman Elementary. I'm Peter Lella from Pullman Elementary too. I'm Paola and from Stillman Middle School. I'm Lane Prado from Burns Elementary. I'm, I'm Aldo Rao uh, from Rivera High School. I'm Santiago de Leon from Pace High School. Thank you guys, you guys did an awesome job. Thank you, you're all um, amazing students and, and we're really excited that we got to have this experience. Thank you again to BISD and thank you again to, to NASA. One second. All right, we promise we will play that video before the end of the event. Um, but right now I would like to hand over the mic to Dr. Rene Gutierrez, the superintendent for the Brownsville Independent School District, to say a few words. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. What an amazing event to have this downlink with uh, NASA and be able to talk to astronauts who are in the space station. That's amazing and incredible. Right, students? It's amazing. Uh, First of all, I'd like to uh, thank some of our uh, city uh, uh, government who are here with all of us. I'd like to recognize our mayor, Mr. Mayor Cowan. You can please stand. Thank you for being here. One of our city commissioners, Mr. Roy de los Santos. Thank you. We also have uh, some of our school board members, our of a Vice President, uh, Board Member Daniela Lopez Valdez. And we have our Board Member, Mr. Eddie Garcia. Thank you for being here. And, you know, it takes all of us uh, from our city to our school district to be able to provide these kind of opportunities for our students. And this is all about uh, promoting science technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM. And we are very fortunate in our district that we have a school board who are very supportive in terms of allowing our students to have as many opportunities as possible. And they provide us with the resources and the funding necessary for us to be able to bring these kind of events to you all, but also to provide you with the, the, the courses the, and the materials and the resources that you need so that we can prepare you. Because I see the next generation of astronauts, the next generation of explorers right here in front of me. You are the next generation. And we want to do events like this to promote science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Colonel Michael Fossum is one of ours. He is from the Rio Grande Valley. He is from McAllen, Texas. Graduated from McAllen High School. So we have one of our own here who had a dream of becoming an astronaut, and he thanked all his teachers, like we have our teachers here in the Brownsville Independent School District that we can thank for preparing you for your careers and for your dreams. And hopefully that uh, you get inspired by this uh, videos and by this kind of an event for you to be the next astronaut, the next engineer, uh, that will be perhaps one day stepping on Mars because you're young enough that you will see it in your lifetime. And we're going to promote that and we're going to help you get there all the way to Mars. And we're very also very fortunate that uh, NASA is only like 
six hours drive from here, but we also have SpaceX right here in our backyard. So there's a world of opportunity, students. Take advantage of them, and we're here to prepare you and to make your dreams come true. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're going to keep moving. So this next section, for the next few minutes, we're not going to take up a lot of time because we have some awesome guest speakers with us, uh, and we're really excited that, and happy that they're here. Um, but we just wanted to take a few minutes to introduce the South Texas Astronomical Society and the, and the Pace Astronomical Society, which you may or may not have heard of. So uh, instead of me introducing it, I would like to play a video for you all. This video was made by one of your very own. He also just graduated from here, uh, Mikel Castillo. He should be somewhere. He actually made this for a DVP competition, and it does a way better job at explaining who we are than we could ever. So thank you, Mikel. Give it up for him. Igniting curiosity. This is the core value and purpose of Star Society's mission, outreaching to the community and providing space and science education to everyone. The South Texas Astronomical Society is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It is an astronomical society for the Rio Grande Valley. It is a forum and an opportunity for the young generation interested in science. It is an educational resource that prioritizes accessibility and is here to help the community. It is a movement allowing students to engage in STEM pathways. In our area, there is very limited resources for K-12 students interested in citizen science, but the Star Society and CTMO are trying to change that. The Christina Thotis Memorial Observatory, or CTMO, is an optical research observatory used by the local university here in Brownsville. This 17-inch telescope is a tool for students to study objects like supernovae, exoplanets, and asteroids. Richard Camucho, who is a PhD student that frequently observes at CTMO, promotes the idea of citizen science. With the help of him and the Star Society, students like me have been able to conduct actual scientific research with this telescope. During the summer, Star Society partnered up with NASA to create a project called Generation Artemis. Generation Artemis is a series of summer camps where students like me volunteer to help teach K-12 students about moon landings and rocket launches. Not only does Star Society advocate for space exploration through projects like these, they give everyone the opportunity to share the love of space through outlets like music, film, and art. In the summer of 2022, the South Texas Astronomical Society's growing partnership with the Texas Space Grant allowed for 12 travel scholarships to be handed to students in accordance with acceptance of the NASA's internship. We spent the summer on remote modules and two weeks on site, working with mentors from the University of Texas at Austin and NASA Matter experts. Of those on site, we were actually invited back to participate in the GLEE program, or the Great Lunar Expedition for Everyone, where we had the amazing opportunity to design, test, and facilitate Lunasat concepts for the upcoming Artemis missions. As an underclassman, it was very difficult to find a science community that wasn't based in a high school. That was until I joined Star Society's Launchpad. Being an active member of Launchpad has allowed me to explore careers in STEM by participating in the construction of a real model rocket. It's an unexpected opportunity that I get to be a part of in the comfort of my own city. People should join the Star Society because there's a place for everybody here. Because you can look up and actually reach for the stars. Because they bring you access to STEM opportunities. Because everyone deserves to see the beauty of our universe. Yeah, there is some serious talent coming out of pace, so good job. All of BISD, really. All right, so um, Mikel said it all, but I just want to reiterate, at the South Texas Astronomical Society, we really have uh, two major objectives. We want to inspire the next generation of scientists and explorers, and we want to develop pathways to careers in space and STEM for our own community, for all of you. And that's exactly what we hope to accomplish uh, with events like this one. So I am going to hand over the mic now to Jacqueline Peña, who is on the video. She is an ambassador for the South Texas Astronomical Society and uh, an awesome representation for what we try to accomplish as an organization. 
Where am I on the slide? The pictures? Hello, y'all. Um, I'm glad to see some familiar faces in the crowd. Y'all look so brilliant. Um, I had the great opportunity to work with the Star Society for a better part of my high school career. It all started with a science fair project. Um, there's a picture of me and my partner circa two years ago when we had the grand, great, and unguided idea to come up with a mission plan design for our science fair project. Um, we tried to make a satellite purposeful cataloging asteroids for future mining missions. Um, it's not too good to do on our own. We were also like 16. But um, thankfully, Star Society was a, or some of the members for Star Society were judges at our district science fair that year. And thanks to Ms. Science, who knew that we really liked space, she was able to let us talk to them after the judging. And I say after the judging, guys, I promise there was no bias. Um, but yeah, they like sat us down. We had a pretty normal conversation. It was like, do you guys like space? And we were like, yeah. And they were like, we're part of space. And then it was like, and that's usually how all our conversations go because it's such a broad topic. But regardless, we were met with nothing but encouragement and an email to contact. And that's how the story goes. Um, eventually, this turned into a long-term project. So by the time we were seniors, um, we figured out that I was a little more into the engineering part and my partner was a little bit more into the astronomy part. And so uh, thanks to our mentors, we went from calculating home and transfers our junior year to doing real research at the Cristina Torres Memorial Observatory our senior year. Um, we were doing ground-based observations of our asteroid candidates at um, under some mentors from graduate student mentors, which they will talk a little bit more about um, in a bit for high school students. But, um, and I'm bringing this all up specifically just to say that as a student, I can attest to STARS being an amazing resource. Uh, it's a group of people willing to encourage your exploration of space interests. And so, um, as the video mentioned earlier, thanks to their partnership with the Texas Space Grant, I, now a couple other students here in this room got to participate in the NASA SEAS internship where we applied expressing our interest in certain space science fields or engineering and we were partnered up with other mentors from UT Austin or industry professionals and got to work on a prompt. Uh, I also got to work on the Glee program so we made these little lunasats but more specifically here in PACE last year a couple of my coworker interns and I founded the PACE Astronomical Society which is the first astronomy club here in the district. And then later on that year, Porter also founded their astronomical society. And hopefully we get to see a few more of them pop up in the other high schools. But if you guys are taking the aerospace engineering career pathway or you just, or you're not and you're interested in space, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be astronomy. You guys could join and stay up to date with our opportunities. Um, but just as a reflective note, I've had the grand opportunity to see the Star Society become a pillar of guidance for the Valley. And I say this to you all very genuinely as having been in your position not too long ago. Um, the space industry and the astronomy research being done here, I mean, there's no better place to be on the frontier of. And I say that to you as someone who's watching all of these developments occur. I hope that you guys are a part of this and that the next time we speak, we're gonna be working together. But I'm gonna go ahead and hand the mic over to Viana Novello, our president for the Pace Astronomical Society this year. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, just to introduce myself again, my name is Ivana Novello. You may have seen me in the video, and I am the current president of the PACE Astronomical Society. So yes, our club was founded last year. And a little bit about the club, um, its purpose and its mission is very similar to that of STARS, which is we want to take all of this, um, all these space opportunities, all of these STEM opportunities, engineering opportunities, anything having to do with space and astronomy back to us as high schoolers, because it's a little bit difficult trying to navigate these pathways from e when everybody here um, has different uh, objectives. And sometimes when you're in a classroom as a student here at Pace, it's a little bit difficult to ask those questions when everybody around you has different ones. So if you were to join, and I hope you guys do, if you were to join the Pace Astronomical, uh, Yes, the Pace Astronomical Society um, will be able to just introduce those opportunities to all of you guys just in a different level and hopefully answer those questions that maybe some of your science teachers just don't have the time for. 
And just to plug ourselves a little bit, tomorrow at um, K207, we will be having our first general meeting. So if anybody here is interested in knowing more about the events that just occurred today, we will be discussing those tomorrow. And it's okay if you don't know, if you have a passion for this yet, if this is what you really wanna do, all we're supposed to do here is just take your curiosity and build it. So thank you. So, um, thank you. Uh, now we're gonna hand it over to Richard Camuccio. He's gonna tell us a little bit more about what we do have to offer the astronomical societies. And like Viviana said, um, our goal is to establish this, not just at Pace, but at all the Brownsville Independent School District schools and eventually all over the Valley. Um, and so I know a lot of the students are here from the schools today. So if you're interested, please talk to us afterwards and we would love to help you any way you, we can. And to tell you more about how, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Richard Camuccio. He is uh, the chief scientist for the South Texas Astronomical Society. He is a graduate researcher at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. And he is the current assistant director of the Dr. Christina Torres Memorial Observatory and a great friend of mine. All right. Thank you, Victor. I don't wanna cause any feedback, sorry about that. How is everybody doing today? Good, great. <laughs> I wanna start with inspiration. Who has looked through a telescope before with their own eyes? Show me your hands. There's a lot of hands that are not raised right now. So one thing uh, that we talked about was ins inspiring the community and then connecting the community to all of these different resources. The Christina Torres Memorial Observatory is one of the main things, the resources that we use. Um, it's not the only thing that we use, but it's a great example. Uh, who, who's been here before? Has anybody actually been here before? Okay, even less hands, so we're gonna change that. Basically, we're trying to connect people in the community to resources like this and show them not only how to use it, but maybe use it for some uh, project that they've been interested in for the long time. Um, a lot of students have had really inspiring projects, like Jackie, for instance, her project with Olivia to send an, uh, a recovery craft to an asteroid collect some material um, called Clio. Uh, two questions that we asked them at the beginning was, well, how would you send something there? And what would you do when you're there? And those two simple questions turned into teaching them how to calculate the orbit to uh, achieve that mission and the different engineering requirements that went into the spacecraft. So if you have projects such as these in your mind, if you have either science fair projects or if you've always been curious about just science questions in general, that's one of the main things that we do. We give access to the sky. So we have this 17 inch telescope right here, which we use for astronomical research and outreach. Uh, there's a camera on the back of it so we can take really deep sky object uh, images, uh, images of galaxies millions of light years away. Uh, as, as was mentioned before, we've looked for things like exoplanets and supernova. And so we give students a lot of opportunities to get their hands on basically a cutting edge research facility for at least observational astronomy. Um, we have a telescope farm. We're growing mini telescopes and out back we call it the, the farm. Nine mini telescopes that will one day give access to the sky uh, for different laboratories. So we have high school labs and uh, undergraduate labs uh, in mind for this. So you'd be able to remotely access these and use them, take pictures for your own projects as well. Uh, not only that, we have, um, well, we have the Southmost Observatory as well, which we're restoring. So we will have, and Bl Blaine is back there making motions because he's helping me with uh, the engineering of it. Basically, we're going to have two observatories in, in the valley, and we'll be able to give access to that one as well to the community. Um, other than that, I guess, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, not only just opportunities for your science projects, but in general, uh, access to be able to develop your skills as a student and uh, perhaps as a scientist or an engineer someday. Uh, one of the examples I wanted to give for this is uh, the ability to develop your science writing skills uh, and communication skills. Uh, we developed a science magazine last year called Far, Far Out. Uh, far, Far Out is actually the farthest object in the solar system known. Uh, it's very far away, and the previously known object was called Far Out. So they had to find, once they found something farther than that. I wonder if that trend will continue, though, and how they'll, uh, they'll continue that trend. But basically, we have a science magazine that's published quarterly that gives students opportunities to hone their writing skills. So if there's something you want to write about, uh, we've had everything from children's art, um, fourth grade you know, cartoons, to um, professors at the university writing about their research. 
So really, uh, the sky's the limit and beyond. And these are just some opportunities that we give. Um, so the next one, by the way, is coming out in October for the eclipse. So uh, I guess I'll just plug in now that if anybody wants to contribute to something like this, you're more than welcome to talk to us after this, and we can set you up. So um, yeah, I think that's that, that's at least the summary of everything. Uh, talk to us, though, because what we want to do is we want to make sure that your uh, curiosity uh, and uh, basically we want to adhere to your curiosity and then to connect you to all these resources so you can make your dreams come true, especially in science and engineering and STEM. So thank you very much. Thank you. Give it up for all of them. Give it up one more time for Richard, Jackie, and Viviana. All right. I get the pleasure to introduce our next panelist. Or sorry. Our first keynote speaker for today. So this is Alex Zamora. He will be our first keynote speaker for today. Alex was born and raised in Brownsville. He graduated from Hannah High School in 2011. Uh, so did I. So I see you guys back there. Um, <laughs> He's currently an intravehicular activities operations flight controller for NASA's Johnson Space Center. And uh, we've been trying to get him to come give a talk for a while. So I'm really glad that we are able to make it happen. And yeah, we, didn't, we went to high school together. We didn't talk very much. But I'm glad that space brought us together to become friends. It, give it up for Alex. Okay. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Victor, for that wonderful introduction. Um, but just to kind of echo it a little bit, my name is Alex Zamora. Uh, I was born and raised here in Brownsville, Texas. I, uh, I'll talk a little bit about more about my early life and different things like that. But right now, I'm, a, uh, I'm an engineer at NASA Johnson Space Center, and I currently support the Operations Support Officer Console in Mission Control so enabling the crew or the astronauts to live and work successfully aboard the International Space Station. So these are some of the pictures that we'll talk a little bit about a little bit later. All right. So I wanted to kind of get like an attention grabber for you guys just right off the bat. So this is a picture that was taken uh, in, about in 2009 from the International Space Station. The crew members that you guys heard answer your questions a little bit earlier, they talked about how high the International Space Station is. It's about 250 miles orbiting the Earth. And this picture, to me, is just, it really hits home quite literally because this picture essentially holds two countries that are right nested together. And I kind of alluded to it a little bit, but does anybody know just by a raise of hands or if you want to shout it out, does anybody know what this is? <laughs> Yeah, so nobody was incorrect. You guys were all right on spot. So this is basically, this is Brownsville bordering uh, Matamoros, Mexico. And let's see here. Yeah, this is the city of Brownsville on the border by the sea. I've highlighted the freeway because that's the freeway that I took to get here. I told you guys I worked at NASA Johnson Space Center. It's about six hours away. Um, and then we are approximately here. So that to me really blows my mind. All of us sitting in this room are pretty much one pixel on the screen. And to me, that just really hits close to home. And I think the other part that is that just really cuts deep through me is the things that you don't see in this picture. So this picture, like I said, was taken aboard the International Space Station. And there's a human, mem there's a human crew member aboard the International Space Station that looked down, saw this, this Earth, and just took a picture. And to me, the human in human spaceflight is what's really interesting to me. And I really, really enjoy it about NASA and everything like that. <clears throat> so let's start about some early years. I already mentioned I was born and raised in Brownsville, Texas. I went to Hudson Elementary and then Oliveira Middle School and then went to Hannah High School and graduated there in 2011. So go Eagles. I know we're at pace, but. <laughs> I 
But yeah, and so when I was growing up, I was that stereotypical kid who just wanted to be an astronaut, right? Every Whenever somebody would ask me, what do you want to do when you grow up? I would always say, I just want to be an astronaut. And, you know, I liked all sorts, everything that got me into that was like Star Wars, video games, different things like that, probably stuff that you guys like, right? And, you know, going out throughout, um, you know, my grade school, I didn't really know that that was an attainable goal. I thought it was just going to be something that, you know, I was just always going to dream and want, but never really achieve. But it wasn't until I got to high school and I met this instructor or teacher that really changed my mind on what is really possible. So I don't see him in the room, but I did see him last time. His name is Mr. Lewis. He used to be a, a teacher out at Hannah High School. And when I was a junior at Hannah High School, that was the first time that the, the astronomy class was being offered to the students. So he opened my eyes as to what was kind of possible, not just visualizing and reading about books um, for all of our neighboring planets in our solar system, but actually going out and looking at them through, through telescopes. And not just that, but our neighboring constellations, uh, galaxies, and nebulas. That was really cool and really, really inspiring. So after that, I'm going the wrong way. After that, I knew I wanted to go to college. I wanted to do something in, in science and in space. And so I started off with computer science. I thought, OK, I like electronics. I think I can do something in computer science. And it didn't, you know, the, the thing that I think resonates with me and is kind of like a theme for me is nothing really went according to plan, but I think I'm right where I, I really want to be. So started with computer science and then just gravitated over to electrical engineering. And right before I graduated, I actually landed an internship here in Brownsville at BPUV, Brownsville Public Utilities Board. And that was really the jumping off point for me, the springboard in my career. At PUB, I got to shadow and was mentored by some world-class, seriously world-class master tradesmen and craftsmen. And it really just set me up for what really is boots on the ground engineering. It was an amazing opportunity and I got lots of really good training from there. And after that, I took that training to San Antonio where I got a job at CPS Energy as an automation engineer, where I was able to build and design the, found the command foundations for operators sitting in a control room, sending commands to offsite substations, gas power plants, and different things like that. And those, those commands were being sent from a control room local in San Antonio to sites that were hundreds of miles away. And I thought, when I was building those out, I thought, hey, this is kind of like a spacecraft, right? We have all sorts of insight into it. We've got pressure, temperature, voltage, and currents, different things like that. And I thought, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can go work at NASA, right? So. You know, with all the resources that we have available, like LinkedIn, Glassdoor, I just, I had a goal in mind. I wanted to work at NASA, wanted to do something in spaceflight. I managed to find a role for an ISS mission operations engineer at Boeing. So if you guys don't know, a lot of the workers at NASA are actually contractors. So as Boeing, uh, Boeing is a contractor for NASA and I work for Boeing. So that's how I got my foot in the door with NASA. And to this day, when I look back at my career at Boeing, that was there was a lot of really high, high points in my career there. I got to be the lead for the lithium ion battery removal and replacement campaign. And one thing to note about that, which was another key point for that for, that for me, was that I was the lead engineer for the electrical power system during the first all-female EBA. And so for, for you guys that don't know, an EBA is an extravehicular activity or a spacewalk. That's when the crew members get in the suit and they go out the door. And they were going out to replace my batteries. And to me, that was just amazing. High point in, in my life. Thank you. And so just from there, I realized, you know, maybe I'm not super in tune with what the systems that we're working with. I kind of like the human element of this. So I moved over to human spaceflight imagery. I worked with some of the guys that got you guys the downlink here today. And then after that, I landed a role as an operations support officer flight controller at, down in mission control. So that's where I'm currently at. And we're gonna dissect that and unpack that just a little bit here. So big picture, what is a flight controller? So a flight controller, we just at a high level, we sit behind computers, we call them consoles. We sit in mission control. We work with the crew members on orbit to 
basically perform maintenance to live and work aboard the International Space Station. And there's all sorts of different disciplines. So there's power, there's attitude determination, trajectory, environmental life and support systems and different things like that. My console that I support is the OSO console or operations support officer. And we're responsible for mechanisms and maintenance. And we'll talk about more, a bit more about what that means. And at the end of the day, we answer to the flight director. So the flight director buys all the risks. They give us go and no go for, to do different things like that. And when I think of a control room, I think just like the old Apollo control room. So for you space buffs out there, this is a picture from the Apollo control room during the Apollo 13 incident. And if you guys don't know, during Apollo 13, when the crew was on their way to the moon, there was an issue with an oxygen tank that burst open and they had to turn around and come back home. As they were coming back home, their carbon dioxide scrubbing capabilities was extremely limited. And then there comes that phrase of, I need to get this square peg in this round hole. And so the, lith the lithium oxide canisters were square for the lunar lander module, and then they were circular for the Apollo module. And so basically, a bunch of OSOs got together. They weren't called the OSOs at the time, but I know deep down they were all OSOs. They got all of the tools and all of the materials aboard the spacecraft, threw it on the table and said, how can we get this to work? And that's essentially what we do in mission control. We make the impossible possible and failure is not an option, especially when it comes to the crew. We need to get the crew back home safely, safe, safely and our priorities are crew vehicle mission, crew being the number one priority for us. So that's what that looks like today. If you guys ever have the opportunity to go up to Houston, you can actually tour this control room. It's period correct. So everything, it's made to look like you're sitting there 1969 in July when we went up to the moon during the Apollo 11 mission. It's actually really, really cool. I highly encourage you guys to make that out, to make that trip out there if you had the opportunity to. But just as naturally as time goes on, the program, NASA as a whole changes, right? NASA is a story about people, in my opinion. And at first, we started with the Mercury program, Gemini program, then went to Apollo program, moved on eventually to Skylab and shuttle, and then eventually the International Space Station, which is where my generation really fits in. I remember looking, watching the news with my mom and dad and just sitting there watching the shuttle take off and land from Cape Canaveral. And I thought, man, that's so cool. The shuttle is like the coolest vehicle. And even to this day, I still am a little biased towards that. And so as mission control changed, the actual control rooms actually changed. So this is what the control room looks like today. It's kind of zoomed in a little bit. You guys actually got to see one of my coworkers on console city next to Capcom today before the downlink started. So that was really cool. But there in the middle, on, or I guess on the left, there's a flight director. Flight director, most important person in the room, and they lead the team from the center. So now let's talk a little bit about my position in that mission control room. So as an operations support officer, we're primarily responsible for something called the common birthing mechanism or the CBM. And that's just a really complicated way of saying we're going to drive a bunch of bolts and put stuff together and create a pressure seal. So the International Space Station is massive. It's about the size of a five bedroom house and it's orbiting the earth at 17,500 miles an hour. Something that big cannot be just launched up as is. So it was actually flown in little pieces, just like this. And there's actually a cool video that I'm going to show you guys a little bit later that shows you how it was built originally. And once assembly was complete, oh, I actually have a video. Sorry about that. Let's see if this plays. Yeah, so this is a time lapse. And I actually looked this up. This is a time lapse of about four hours. And this is the crew members tearing down and opening the hatch to a visiting vehicle in this case. But I imagine it would have looked fairly similar during assembly when a new module was flown up and we had to basically set up all of the vestibules. That way we're ready to ingress safely. And it's about like a 30 second minute long video, all a compressed time lapse of about four hours. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, and in this case, I think they're birthing Cygnus NG13 or 15. But at assembly complete, that's what the International Space Station looks like. It looks a little bit different nowadays, but it's about the span of a football field, so 100 yards. That helps it to put into perspective, I think at least. And then 17,500 miles an hour is extremely fast, and it's hard to even just imagine, right? 
And so I put this video in here. This is a time lapse, but it's pretty close to what, the, what it looks like from the downlinks. And the thing that I find most fascinating is that super thin horizon that really keeps us alive, essentially, right, in our spaceship of Earth. So another responsibility that we have is we perform crew system and on-orbit maintenance training for the astronauts aboard the International Space Station. So we essentially enable the crew members to live and work aboard the International Space Station. And some of the crew members actually talked about a lot of the stuff that I wanted to talk about, but I actually brought some videos for you guys. So I, I hope that that basically puts it more into perspective. So this is a picture of the first six-person crew aboard the International Space Station on Expedition 20. And I've actually gotten to train uh, the gentleman on the bottom right. That's Dr. Michael Barrett, and he's actually flying up soon on a Soyuz, so I'm really looking forward to seeing him up there and seeing all the stuff that he's going to do uh, for us maintenance-wise. But moving on from that, we're going to talk about how we can eat, sleep, and work aboard the International Space Station. So here on Earth, it's really trivial, right? It's like most folks will just grab something, put it in the microwave, and we're re all ready to eat. But on orbit, it looks a little bit different. And the galley is where the crew members were going to congregate so that they can prepare their food. And I have a video here that's going to show you guys what that really looks like. Welcome back to Expedition 62 on the International Space Station. Tonight, we thought we would show you a little bit about some meal prep, what we do for meals on board the space station. How do we prepare our food? So the answer is we have a great variety of food up here. Two different uh, general types of food, thermostabilized food and these green packets that's very similar to military MREs or meals ready to eat. And then we also have uh, freeze-dried food. So all of the water content has been sucked out. This is just basic asparagus, so we need to add the water back in. We want to make sure all that water is mixing in, and then we usually put it here inside the food warmer. And then we have refrigerated space here. They've been nice enough to allow us to use these just for food. All right. Dinner, dinner time. Table. Some Turkish fish stew. I have butternut squash. All right. I'm having, uh, I have rice with butter, some lentil soup, and grilled chicken patty. A lot of the Russian food comes in cans. This was one of my favorites. This is uh, spicy beef and rice. Space makes eating a lot more fun. You can turn your spoon upside down or even let it go and nothing's gonna fall off. You can eat in any direction. You can eat upside down if I want to. So that looks a little bit different than what your and I's meal time looks like at home, I bet. All right. So we talked about eating. Now we're going to talk a little bit about sleeping. So sleeping is something that we just do naturally, right? Um, I know that's one of my favorite things about my day when I get to go home and just really decompress from a long day's work. But that even that looks totally different on the International Space Station. And so I have uh, Chris Hatfield here that's going to show you guys a little bit about what that looks like. Hi, Chris Hatfield here aboard the International Space Station. We keep busy on board the space station. Long days, lots of work, physical exercise. At the end of it, you're tired. But how do you sleep in space? In order to make it comfortable for the astronauts, originally they were going to put us all in one habitation module with sleep stations all around it. But the way a station was eventually built, we have sleep stations inside Node 2, which is in the forward part of the station, and inside the service module, which is in the aft. A total of six small bedrooms, sleep stations, or sleep pods. And inside each one is just a sleeping bag tied to the wall. You might think it's uncomfortable not having a mattress and a pillow, but without gravity, of course, you don't need anything to hold you up. You can just completely relax, and you don't even need a pillow. In space, you don't even have to hold your head up, so you can relax every muscle in your body, and your arms float up in front of you, your head tips forward. But before I go to sleep, i got to put on my pajamas, because I have space jammies. I'll be right back. Great. I'm in my super comfy Russian full-length pajamas. Nice for when you have to get up in the middle of the night. 
and uh, ready to go to bed. I'll show you where I sleep. This is my sleep station, my sleep pod. This is uh, where I spend up to eight hours every day here on board the space station. It's actually on the floor, but uh, once you're inside, you just can't tell. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I enjoyed that, especially the little song is pretty cute. And I'm actually going to skip over this video here. We thought you might. Just a second here. All right. So we learned how to essentially live on the International Space Station. But like we talked about earlier, it's a five bedroom house. For some of you guys, you guys have never have been alive at a point where there has been a continuous presence of humans abo aboard the International Space Station and in orbit. And to me, that blows my mind. So I'm 30 right now. That didn't, the crew has been up in orbit for about 24 years now. Not the same crew, it's, it's changed <laughs> quite a bit. But to me, that really blows my mind. And so with a 24 year old house, things just naturally stop working or they don't work as they intended to. So we also train the crew on how to do complex maintenance, preventative maintenance and contingency maintenance when things do go wrong. And so we are on the ground to help them walk through some of those complex maintenance activities. And I have some pictures of some of the crew members that just came down from Crew 6. One of them, his name is Woody Hoberg. And, oops, I went the wrong direction again. Oh, but I have this picture of this really cool guy. If you guys don't know who this is, I'm sure by the end of, this, by the end of today, you will know who this is. So this is Colonel Mike Fossum, and he's actually doing some maintenance aboard the International Space Station during his time there. And what he's doing here is he's taking out the CEDRA bed. So CEDRA is stands, it's an acronym. It stands for Carbon Dioxide Removal Assembly. And he's doing some maintenance on it because, like I said, some stuff, when it's been operating for so long, doesn't work as you expected it. And so on the ground, it was tested a certain way. And if we found out on orbit, it worked a little bit different. So this is him getting ready to just throw that like a football down the lab. So I think that that's a really cool picture of Mike. And I wanted to include that in here just for him. But here's another crew member working on the same rack. So this is Woody Hoberg. I talked about him a little bit earlier. He's a crew member from Crew 6. He actually just splashed down last weekend. He's doing some seizure maintenance as well. And it, it looks a little bit different. The hardware looks a little bit different because we were doing some maintenance on some other stuff. We had to pull out that piece of hardware right there. It's called TCCS, Trace Contamination Control System. And we needed to pull that out just to be able to get access to it. So maintenance always looks a little bit different and half the time it doesn't go the way you expected, just like on your house. And this is another part that I thought was really cool. So in this, in this picture, you have Woody and you have Sultan and they're, they're floating in node one and in the zenith direction, there's actually what they call the Z1 dome. And in the Z1 dome, there's a hatch where they have a bunch of stowage behind that hatch. Well, that stowage actually caused the, the ribs of the hatch to get stuck. And so if you guys go to Twitter, uh, you guys can do this on your own time. I can't zoom in on this picture. But you'll see what they use to get that open. And they basically use all sorts of like restraints and mobility aids, like tape, all sorts of crazy, wacky stuff like wires and stuff like that. And so that's basically that, that whole thing that we do. We do that on the ground and we write procedures for the crew to be able to do that on orbit and work with that, work alongside them from the ground. And then here's a picture, here's actually gonna be a video of Woody Hoberg doing some really complicated maintenance that some of my coworkers did. And this is a really, really cool video because you get to go actually behind the racks down into the pressure shell of the International Space Station. So I'll hand it over to Woody. 
All right, welcome to node three aboard the International Space Station. This is not normally how this module looks. Normally, our toilet stall is right here. We've actually pulled that out of the way so that we can rotate this rack up. Now, this rack contains many of our systems for water reclamation. So that's all of the equipment that we use to convert urine into clean drinking water aboard the space station. And today, we've been working on swapping out some modules in this rack. We're actually going to be installing a new purge pump and separator assembly later this afternoon. This morning, what we did was we rotated the rack up, and we started routing some power cables, as well as this separator vent hose, uh, some of the plumbing that we're going to be hooking up later this afternoon. And we had to rotate the rack because this these uh, cables actually uh, route all the way through the bottom of the rack and they kind of poke out behind the rack. So we've been spending a lot of time down in the guts behind the rack. So I'll show you real quick. Back behind this rack, you see we have access to a lot of systems. And this is also, these are those same, this is that same power cable we were just looking at. And so we have access to route it and get it nicely secured back here in the back. It's kind of cool back here. We don't often rotate these racks, but um, you can actually see right here the pressure shell of the International Space Station. So we are living inside of a cylindrically shaped, uh, many cylindrically shaped modules. And this right here is the pressure shell that is holding one atmosphere of pressure inside the space station in here. And right outside this shell is the vacuum of space. Uh, some other details you can see here, this wiring leads to these things we call shell heaters. So this shell heater uh, is used to maintain the temperature of the shell and make sure that thermal uh, contra contraction and expansion don't impact the uh, structural integrity of the pressure shell. And so we're pretty careful when we come back here. Normally this is all protected by the racks, but we're careful not to uh, damage this delicate wiring and these shell heaters. And so this afternoon, Sultan and I are gonna be uh, finishing up installing that purge pump separator assembly, and then we will uh, rotate the rack back and get everything closed up back to normal. And I'm happy to say that that install was successful and that actually led to the amount, the a record of water reclamation aboard the International Space Station. So after that pump package was installed, we now rec reclaim about 98% of all of the water that's consumed on the International Space Station. So to me, that was really cool. That's leading the pathway and paving the path for the moon, Mars, and beyond. All right, and so I glossed over that other uh, slide a little bit earlier, but this is a picture of me inside Mission Control. I'm actually sitting on console for an extravehicular activity or an EVA for a crew member, for a couple of crew members that are trying to bring an antenna that had failed on the International Space Station on the inside, so that way we can bring it down to the ground to refurbish it. So. They, the crew, unfortunately, was not able to remove the antenna from the outside structure of the International Space Station. But no worries there, because now we have, uh, that gave, actually gave me the opportunity to train two other crew members that are going to fly. One of them is actually up there right now, and you guys just heard from her earlier. So this is a picture of me training Jasmine Mogbelli, as well as Laurel O'Hara. Jasmine is currently on board the International Space Station, but Laurel will fly on a Soyuz here pretty soon. And they're going to actually go outside of the International Space Station and attempt to retrieve that antenna again in a different fashion. So that's what that antenna looks like. It's got like this big old cone attached to it. That's the S-band antenna. And that's how we get commands from the ground over to the International Space Station. And I have their pictures up there. It's kind of hard to see. I think uh, Jasmine's wearing a mask and Laurel's facing away. But you kind of get it, right? <laughs> All right. And then I have one video here. And I'm going to rush through some of my videos just because I don't have a whole lot of time for you guys. But I wanted to, to just really emphasize here is like right now it's the time of the International Space Station. But what's next? The moon, Mars, and beyond. And that's where you guys come in. I'm here to really try to emphasize that you guys are the Artemis generation. 
and this video gives me chills every time I watch it, so I wanted to show it to you guys. So here we go. At NASA, we have always answered the innate call to go. With Artemis, we are going to stay. Proving that humanity can live on the moon, Mars, and other worlds. And share the wonders of the solar system with all. Our story is one of people. All those who make this journey possible. From advocates across communities. To companies across industries. To countries around the world. We achieve this collective endeavor. Our efforts create impact for all. Technologies that revolutionize industries. And jobs that bring prosperity to people. The discoveries from space benefit the way we live on Earth today. And those from the moon will create a better future for generations to come. But to do that, we must go. Hi, I'm Chell Ingram. My name is Raja Chari. Kayla Barron. Kate Rubens. Hi, I'm Christina Cook. NASA astronaut Joe Acaba. Jessica Meir. Woody Hoberg. Anne McLean. Stephanie Wilson. My name is Johnny Kim. Nicole Mann. Victor Glover. Jessica Watkins. Hi, I'm Matthew Dominic. Jasmine Mogbelli. Frank Rubio. Scott Tingle. This is what we do. This is what we will do. Let's go. We go to the moon to learn how to live on other planets. For the benefit of all. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that because you guys truly are the Artemis generation, right? So you met our Artemis crew members, but what's next after that is Mars and beyond. And so for some of you guys that don't know, right now the Artemis program is in full swing. Artemis 1 launched on November and it carried the Orion spacecraft all the way out to the moon. And it went about the furthest that any human rated spacecraft has ever gone before about 43,000 miles away from the lunar surface. And we did that as an engineering mission to test out all of the life support systems and propulsion systems aboard the Orion spacecraft. And some of the pictures that just came back were just mind blowing to me. So I have a video here that I'm gonna skip over. Yep, okay. So this is one of those pictures from 43,000 miles away from the lunar surface. Here, there's a camera mounted on a solar array, and the solar array is pointing at the Orion vehicle. And you can catch the, the lunar surface as well as Earth in that picture. When I saw this first picture come out, it just gave me chills and just inspired me to, it just made me want to work even harder and get the crew members there. This is what the vehicle looks like once it's splashed down. So this is that same vehicle that you saw earlier. It looks a little bit toasty like a marshmallow because it just re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and it's coming back from lunar orbit. So it's coming in super, super fast. And in that vehicle, I actually, now I'm, I was lucky enough to be selected for the Artemis 3 and 4 missions as a IVA operations flight controller. So I will be sitting in the back room for Artemis 3 and in the front room for Artemis 4. And with that, we have to train the crew how to live inside the Orion spacecraft, as well as SpaceX's HLS, hum, uh, Human Landing Systems Lander. And so I got to be able to take a class to familiarize myself with the Orion spacecraft, and I'm currently working uh, to certify on some lessons that we're gonna train crew a little bit later this year. And so I'm gonna, st I'm gonna play you one more video, and I'm gonna stop it a little bit short. So I want you guys to meet the Artemis II crew. I'm Christina Cook. I'm a mission specialist. I'm Jeremy Hansky. I'm a mission specialist. I'm Victor Glover. I'm the pilot. I'm Reed Wiseman. I'm the commander for the Artemis II mission to the moon. To the moon. To the moon. To the moon. To 
<laughs> All right, yeah, so that's the Artemis II crew. So you have Commander Reed Wiseman, Pilot Victor Glover, and Mission Specialist Christina Koch, and Jeremy Hansen. These guys are world-class astronauts. I've actually had the pleasure of working with them a little bit closely, especially Christina. She was the first, uh, she was one of the females on the all-female EBA when they were replacing the lithium-ion batteries. So I'm extremely humbled to be able to work with them here pretty soon. And this is what the Apollo 2, or sorry, got sidetracked there. The Artemis 2 mission is going to look like. So the Artemis 2 mission is not going to actually land on the moon. It's just going to orbit the moon. And we're going to do that so that we can test all of the environmental life control uh, systems. And then if you look on the right-hand side over there, we're actually going to test a lot of the propulsion elements. So the Orion vehicle is going to separate from what they're calling the ICPS, which is the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion System. And it's going to do a set of maneuvers in order to test the propulsion system aboard the Orion vehicle in preparation for Artemis III, which is when we're going to land on the moon with, drumroll please, what you guys, what's being built in you, you guys' backyard, right? So SpaceX won the contract for the Artemis III lander, and they're currently building the human landing system via this SpaceX's Starship. And so this is what it's, this is a rendering of what it's gonna look like on the surface of the moon. And this vehicle is massive. I've gotten an opportunity to get into a VR headset standing at the base of this vehicle and it's like you're looking at a skyscraper it is insane and i'm so excited for the crew members that are going to go be able to do this it's going to be something amazing and so this is this is the last slide that I'll, i have to talk i think um and this is the artemis 3 flight path so the crew member the four crew members are going to ingress the orion capsule they're going to launch from cape canaveral they're going to launch to the moon and they're going to orbit and rendezvous with the spacex's hls Two crew members will then transfer into the human landing system, and then the HLS will go down and descend onto the lunar surface where the crew will do EVAs. They'll get back into their HLS vehicle and then ascend back and transfer back into Orion to come back home. So I'm super excited for this mission. I think you guys should be too. When I know before Artemis was a thing, I always said, man, I wish I was alive during the Apollo days where I could have seen that Apollo 11 landing that would have been amazing. And I, was, I always felt a little bit envious of all of the folks that got to see that on live television. So I say all this to inspire you guys. Hopefully, you guys are the Artemis generation that is going to take us to, moon, to the moon and Mars. We can't do this without you. And I mean that wholeheartedly. SpaceX can't do it without you. NASA can't do it without you. We can't do it without you. This is all up to you guys. I hope that you guys are the, I'm looking at the next engineers, science, scientists, technologists, and mathematicians right in front of me. I was where you guys once were. I know you guys can do it too. And I can't wait for one of you guys to be up here in a few years talking to some of your peers down the road. So once again, my name is Alex Zamora and it was a pleasure talking to you guys. Thank you for your time. He turned off the mic on me. If you guys had questions for Alex, which I'm sure you do, don't worry. We're going to have a panel later on um, with uh, most of the people that have been on stage already, and, uh, and so you will get a chance. But I'm going to hand it over now to Dr. Rita. Howdy, howdy. That's what we say from Texas A&M, and Colonel Fossum's from Texas A&M. So we want to make him feel a little welcome. So how about we try it? Howdy. I know you can do it louder, Roy. You were there. You were in the core. I remember. Howdy. Howdy. There you go. You feel better now, Mike? Feel at home, Colonel? I get to introduce the coolest guy in the room. And it's not just this room. It's any room. Any room Colonel Fossil in, it's, he's the coolest guy. He is. There's a lot of cool kids and cool people in here. You got our mayor. Pretty cool guy. Great family man. Great businessman. Very successful but yet he chose to serve his community. That's a pretty cool guy. Colonel Fossum is a cool guy for lots of reasons. As a kid in McAllen, he was a Boy Scout. He didn't want to be just a Boy Scout. He had to rise to be the best. He was an Eagle Scout. And now he's helping other Eagle Scouts rise. And he's a Boy Scout leader. He camps every year with Boy Scouts. 
What makes him so cool is once he reaches his mission, once he has accomplished his mission, he turns around and he grabs the next guy and brings him up with him. That's what makes him cool. Sure, he was an astronaut. Let's talk a little bit about that. Three, place, three space flights, three. That means he strapped himself to this big old bomb and launched himself into space. And his wife, the beautiful Melanie, gets to watch and pray along the way. 48 hours on spacewalks. 48 hours just floating around, looking down. I'd be a little scared. 19 years as an astronaut, 2,000 hours in aircraft up in space. Clearly the coolest guy in the room. And now he leads Texas A&M University in Galveston, where he helps students and future students. You should, I encourage you to go visit him there, reach their dreams. He accomplishes his mission, and then he turns around and lifts the next guy in Gala. That's what makes him the coolest guy in the room. And my phone, when he calls me, I get all excited because it launches my favorite astronaut, because he by far is my favorite astronaut, and he's from the Valley. When the mayor calls, my bad pastor. Am I allowed to say that? I don't teach here anymore, so I guess I can. Yeah. So it is with great honor that I get to introduce my favorite astronaut, the coolest guy in any room he's in, Colonel Mike Fossum. But let me do one thing. There's one more cool guy. Where's Victor? Victor's a pretty cool guy. Pretty cool guy. Graduated from Texas A&M. Whoop. Graduated from Texas A&M. Um, works in computer software to pay the bills. And works for nonprofit to pay his soul and to serve you. That's a pretty cool guy. Get to your goal, turn around, and lift up the others. And he's in a rock band. I mean, okay, that's pretty cool. But by far the coolest guy in the room, my dear friend, my favorite astronaut, Colonel Mike Fossum. <laughs> Dr. Rita, thank you very much. That's the most unusual introduction I've had, or maybe one of the most personal. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, you forgot that up there. Let's see, Victor, you're going to help get the slides going. Now, Hattie, actually, Rita mentioned that I le now lead the uh, Galveston campus of Texas A&M, and I'm going to go to the next slide there. And yes, I, I actually retired from NASA uh, six and a half years ago. I never thought I'd leave. I dreamed about flying. You know, I, I dreamed about flying in space starting in July of 1969, when a lot of us, are, well, if older the the older of us watched Apollo 11 land on the moon. And I remember going out into the backyard of our house in McAllen uh, late that night when the moonwalk ended, looking up at the moon hanging over my backyard, just shaking with excitement that we'd done it. We'd actually done it. And uh, that started this crazy dream about flying in space. Let me ask the young people here. And you, oops, something just fell off the back. You could be young of any age. How many of you have a, a dream for the future, you young people that are still in school, especially. All right, man, almost every hand's up. I've got a few of my students that ask questions that don't have their hands up, that's shocking. Uh, okay, how many of you, yeah, I did too. How many of you have, with those really big dreams, keep the lights up a little bit, please. How many of you have people laughing and telling you that's impossible, you're crazy? Okay, I was one of those. So I talked about flying in space and people laughed at me. Your dad didn't go to college, who do you think you are? Nobody from the valley does that kind of thing. You know, you, just shut up, you're weird. <laughs> okay, and yeah, maybe I was a little bit, but I never gave up and I kept working, you know, leaning forward that I also didn't always believe, but I never thought I'd leave NASA once I got there. It took me so long to get there. I, uh, I, I wasn't selected as an astronaut until I was 40 years old. I'd been applying for 13 years and, and then was fortunate to fly. But, you know, life happens and things come along. And about seven years ago, I heard that there was an opening to be a vice president of Texas A&M University 
running a special campus that's in Galveston that is part of Texas a &M University. Same diploma, same Aggie ring, same tier one institution. And I didn't even have to leave my house by NASA because it's just a 35, 40 minute commute. So I, I, I actually left the job I loved. And I, I, I'm so just homesick seeing all my friends there, you and the Oso team, that's the Bears, right? That was their symbol for the Osos, the, the people that really helped us maintain and fix and repair things up there in space. And, and seeing all the, the, the crew members up there, a lot of them I helped select as part of the selection committee you know, at NASA and seeing them, just amazing videos. And, uh, you know, and I love it. But I, I actually answered another call to come to Texas a &M University to help, because I know the power of a positive program to change young people's lives. And now I get to be part of it there while still living in my same community and things like that. The Galveston campus started because of a Maritime Academy um, 61 years ago. In, uh, in Galveston. So those students get their degree and their Coast Guard license to be officers on ships. The ones that are in that, the, the beginning level is the third mate, future ship captain. They're all starting at, you know, between about 100 and 120,000 a year. The marine engineers that get their degree in marine engineering technology and their ship license. Are, are they have starting salaries between 100 and 200 thousand dollars a year. It's huge. Nobody knows about it, but the Port of Houston, the Port of Ga uh, Brownsville knows about them because they're coming in and out of here. These are the people that are all over the globe, as as well as working in the port, the port pilots and things like that. Um, just, it's really important for our entire state. The Port of Houston alone is responsible for 20 percent of the GDP of the state of Texas. So it's huge jobs. Besides the Maritime Academy, we've got the Marine Sciences, Marine Biology, Marine Environmental Sciences, Maritime Business, um, and uh, very large growing engineering programs, as well as humanities and other pre-professional programs. So I had to come, and I've got a few brochures that tell a little bit about our campus from anybody there, especially from the schools, just to help uh, share this stuff with the, uh, with the young people for career options. So before I go too far, I, I do want to inter and briefly introduce my family. When you're an astronaut, you get to take really cool family photos. So I took this before my first space shuttle flight. And to give you an idea how old it is, that cute little bugger in the bottom uh, corner over here, he just finished his, uh, with his uh, master's degree in nuclear engineering and starts a job on Monday in, uh, d in, at Idaho National Laboratories designing next generation nuclear power plants and and young people again he he had a rough journey just like i did just like some of you may you know he dropped out of of college during his junior year he was in the wrong major and uh, he took some time to get his head straight and what fit bit him was the desire to make a difference in something that he really was excited about it wasn't space, it wasn't following me, it wasn't following his sister into you know, oil field analysis or his oldest brother as a fighter pilot or the uh, one in blue there is in law school now. Nope, he had his own path. And once he got in there, he went from dropout to dean's list and a full scholarship for graduate school and now he's going to his dream job. And you know, that's what we all dream about. So my journey took me from McAllen and thanks to a high school teacher, uh, Roberto Gonzalez, who introduced me to Texas A&M, told me I was going to be an engineer. And then uh, uh, he arranged for another teacher to drive me and some buddies up to College Station to visit A&M. I got there. I loved it. I'm going to this school. I, I, I had no idea what engineering was about, but I had a problem. It was expensive. My dad didn't go to college. Money was a real issue. I was the oldest of three boys. So the only way I could afford to go to Texas A&M was to join the Corps of Cadets and uh, take an ROTC scholarship. I didn't want to go in the Air Force. I had no desire when I, went, when I wanted to go to A&M to go in the service, but you know what? That four years of education, I owe them four years later. I figured I'd pay that off and I'd be on my way. But wow, you know, I kind of had one good deal after the other. I really enjoyed what I was doing. I got into... Uh, you know, when I graduated from A&M, I did commission and I uh, had a few jobs. The quick 
you know, early ones there, but then I applied to go to Air Force Test Pilot School. I had, was not a top student in high school. I was not a top student in, uh, uh, at Texas A&M. Uh, the Air Force sent me to get a master's degree in engineering in Ohio. I did a little better, but I, wouldn't, I wasn't top of the class kind of thing. But along the way, I actually met some astronauts, and they saw a spark in me, and they encouraged me. And, and, and told me about this career path to be a flight test engineer. So I'm not a test pilot, but I, I went to Air Force Test Pilot School to learn to fly in the backseat of jets, to do flight tests, and uh, develop the new things. And I was, when I got there, I knew this, po this possibility of flying in space was real, but I had to show clear signs of excellence, which I had never showed before. It didn't, I didn't show up at a young age. So when I went to test pilot school in the Mojave Desert of California, you know, I was just driven. I'd never been in a small airplane before. I'd never been in a Cessna. I'd been in an airliner once or twice. Uh, but all of a sudden, I'm strapped in the backseat of supersonic jets. I graduated in the, for the first time in my life as number one in my class, and that gave me the opportunity to fly get the number one job choice coming out of test pilot school. So I was flying the backseat of F-16 fighters. It's where I started, and, uh, and, and I, yeah, I loved doing the flight test. I got into the stealth technology world, the classified world and stuff, doing eight years of flight test. But the same time I graduated from test pilot school, I submitted my first application to be an astronaut. I said, I got it now, man. I'm the top grad. They're going to pick me for sure. And... Uh, and, uh, you know, I got an interview, and they rejected me. Yikes. And I applied again, and I, I interviewed again, and I got rejected again, et cetera. And, you know, finally, I, I decided to, to leave. I got rejected three times when I was in the Air Force. This is years apart. And I decided, you know, it's time for me to get my family back to Texas. So I left active Air Force. I stayed in the reserves moved my family to Houston where I got a job working as an engineer at NASA. And of course I kept applying, right? Otherwise the story would be pretty boring. But I, I kept applying and finally then after uh, 13 years of applying, uh, I, you know, I was selected as an astronaut. And we take these official photos and here's a photo of me before my first space shuttle flight in the spacewalk suit. And uh, and, uh, you know, and then later on, 12 years ago, I launched with the Russians, and they, I got old or something, I don't know, uh, or they're not as good at Photoshop as the NASA photo people are, uh, but, you know, it was just an, an amazing adventure, and then, of course, being at, at, at NASA there, you know, it means back to, to continue flying jets, so we were flying the T-38 supersonic aircraft as part of our training. That, that's, I, that's my best impression of the Tom Cruise flight line strut. How'd I do? Yeah, no. <laughs> hey, okay, you could be honest. I, I'll be honest. I know he's better looking. That's okay. I'm taller. I've met him. Getting ready to fly. I was fortunate to fly two times on the space shuttle. Uh, my first space shuttle mission was a return to flight mission after the accident that we had in 2003. So there was a lot of tension. We lost a crew, seven dear friends. Uh, while they were returning home because of damage to the heat shield on their space shuttle. So there was a lot of pressure you know, on us as we were uh, preparing for this uh, second of the return to flight missions. But, you know, mostly you're just excited because, uh, you know, I'm 48 years old there and my dream is finally coming true. So I flew uh, to the space shuttle missions and, uh, and, and uh, the first one in 2006. Uh, and uh, did two, three spacewalks, and then two years later, I was back up again to do another two space or three spacewalks. And uh, it's interesting, actually, watching uh, Frank and Jasmine today. They were in the Japanese uh, Kibo module, the la uh, the laboratory module, and I installed that in 2008. So that was our big mission: was to take up this new laboratory and attach it to the space station and get it all ready to uh, to go to work. It's, uh, it's interesting to me to see how they've redecorated uh, once again in there. But it was uh, after the two shuttle missions and the boss asked me to do something hard, something I actually did not want to do. I tried to turn it down three times. And he finally told me, Mike, I'm not asking. 
it's time to salute and get to work, and that was to be a long-duration space station member. He said, I need a spacewalker, space station commander, and you're it. Um, and so I, I, I started training to be a member of Expedition 28 and the commander of Expedition 29. And, that, and I, what I really tried to push it all, the whole thing off by a year, because in order to fly this mission, I would be launching on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft, and I would have to be fairly fluent in the Russian language, and I wasn't. I wish Spain or Mexico had been the major partner in the space station program instead. I would have had better luck with Spanish. But I had to jump into language training. I lived with a family for a month in Moscow and, and, and stuff. But, so, but this is my crew. We launched in groups of three. These are the ones I launched with. And then these guys on the, on the right joined us uh, then later. But uh, what an amazing adventure. Space, uh, training for a space shuttle mission was about one year of training. And it was almost all at home in Houston. Uh, space station training was about two and a half years of training because not only did I have to learn the entire space station, I'd helped design a lot of it. By the way, I, I had fingerprints all over that common birthing mechanism. I was helping design that in the uh, mid '90s out at Marshall, um, and uh, you know, and so the uh, but you have to learn all of the uh, the internal parts, and I also had to learn a new spaceship, the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. So I was traveling about out of the country about half of the time for two and a half years, going to Russia, uh, Japan, Germany, Canada, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, it, it was an amazing adventure. But what a joy! A lot of it was in Russia, learning the new uh, the new spacecraft. This is in Star City, outside of Moscow. Uh, we're at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center with a Soyuz capsule right behind us that we trained in. And uh, the, it was, I, I loved the training, though. It was just amazing meeting these crews, these teams from around the planet that are all passionate about space, making things happen. Finally, it's time to get ready to leave. And uh, the, the Americans don't have a lot of these big ceremonies and stuff, but the Russians, they're all about ceremonies. If Yuri Gagarin did it in 1961, well, we got to do it too. So in 1961, Yuri Gagarin went to Red Square in front of St. Basil's Cathedral, uh, and so we did too. And in fact, the flowers in our hands were about to put on the graves of the Soviet space pioneers, including Yuri Gagarin, who are buried in the walls of the Kremlin as a way of paying tribute there. Um, after that, we went and did like, uh, we, we went and, and into a two week quarantine in Kazakhstan. And uh, we flew the launch complex is actually in Kazakhstan. It's not in Russia, but the old Soviet Union, it's further south, which is better. So we're there, and I uh, had some, uh, some of my family and a few close friends were able to come out and be with us as we were going through that, uh, that last launch preparation. Finally, we launched in the June of 2011 in the middle of the night uh, on the Soyuz spacecraft here. And uh, interesting thing, I mentioned Yuri Gagarin being the first human in space. This launch pad that we're launching from in June of, 19, of, of, of 2011 was the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin launched from in April of 1961 when he became the first human in space. 50 years later, we're still using the same launch pad. The Russians don't throw anything away. The bravest people, though, are not the people sitting on top of that rocket. Yeah, everybody thinks it is. You got to be incredibly brave. No, we're a bunch of 12 year olds fist pumping. Uh, the bravest people involved are the ones that are watching somebody they love climb on top of a bomb because that's what they see. That's my family lit up by the light of our rocket as we're clawing our way into the sky. Um, the Soyuz is an amazing ride. It was about, uh, about uh, nine minutes to orbit, liquid fueled engines, very different ride from the shuttle. Uh, but really, really tight, and I'm going to show some video of that in a little bit. You know, once we got up there, then it's time to get to work. Okay, again, this was not a two-week mission. This was almost half a year in space. Uh, that had me more keyed up than anything, I think, just the fact that I'm leaving the planet for half a year. And you can't just go home because there's a problem at home. Uh, and so, you know, I was just really nervous. But once you get up there, you get back into the mission, and you really adapt to living and working up there constantly, working on lots of different uh, systems. I sure wish I had some of these great videos. It's, it's, uh, 
it's great though, but working on over 200 different scientific experiments, and I'm not a scientist, but I'm a kind of a glorified laboratory technician. Uh, this is a, a combustion facility here that I was trying to follow the procedures that these guys gave me to work on it. And it was one of those points of contention that I had. I remember being really frustrated because it was so confusing. And it wasn't this part, it was actually the backside part that was really confusing. And I called to the ground and I said, have I ever seen this before? I didn't feel like I'd ever seen it. They, yes, Mike, you have. Okay. And I kept working, I'm running behind. Everything's scheduled really tightly. And finally said, when did I see this before? Oh, it was two years ago you were trained on it, Mike. Oh, thanks. Uh, anyway, that's when the just-in-time videos and stuff started to be really popular. Uh, you know, in addition to all the work up there, you're working on different uh, uh, scientific experiments and keeping the space station systems functioning. I need to hear more about that 98% reclamation of water. Wow. Uh, you have to keep yourself functioning, too. And that means exercising vigorously, for me, six days a week, and uh, some of the exercise equipment we had up there. Um, and also, part of the science we did was we were the guinea pigs, so we were drawing blood from each other. We collected blood, urine, ew, uh, hair, skin, saliva, uh, ultrasounds of our heart, uh, and uh, as well as EKG scans and ultrasounds of our leg muscles to see how they, things change, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, living in space means that some things are just unusual, too. Like, you can wash your hair without getting your shirt wet. Look at that. It just kind of clings now. If you get all crazy with how you're scrubbing, you're going to have stuff going in all directions, and your crew members are going to hate you. Uh, but you can just massage it in there and then kind of towel it and rinse it out. And you can take fun crew photos. This was during the very last space shuttle mission. So you got all these ugly dudes with uh, Sandy Magnus in the middle there. The spacewalking definitely was my favorite thing to do. I, I loved the physicalness of it, the challenge of it, getting in a suit that's inflated to 4.3 pounds, that last look through the little porthole in the airlock hatch before we exit to go outside. And, uh, and then working out there. The suit itself has to protect you from temperature extremes from plus and minus 250 degrees. So when the sun is shining on you, it'll boil water. When you get exposed to deep, sun, uh, deep darkness and deep space, the, the, the temperature is sucked out of everything. And so things like frostbite in your fingertips are a real concern. And the suit itself is inflated, so you're working against this inflated suit, inflated gloves, and space walking doesn't use legs much. It's really upper body and hands. Uh, but obviously, you don't have to be Superman. Uh, this is actually my first, very first spacewalk as we're testing the stability of this boom to uh, hold us steady in case we had to do repairs to the space shuttle's heat shield. Uh, that was about the most terrified I've been in my life. <laughs> was hanging on the end of that boom out there. It, I, I, again, I loved the physical challenge of, of spacewalking. It, you, I, I didn't take much time to just look around and appreciate. There were moments on every one of them, but mostly it's, it, looking down was terrifying. Looking from past your feet, 250 miles to the ground, going by at 17,500 miles an hour, or five miles a second was impossible to comprehend. So I just tried to get the job done and uh, occasionally enjoy the, a, a sunrise or sunset. But you can see, I love this picture because with the earth out there, the deep black of space, you can sense a little curve in the horizon. But check out that blue line. That blue line is what separates the earth itself from the blackness of space. That's our atmosphere. And uh, if any of you fly through the Houston airport, keep an eye out for my favorite selfie. It's, it's both in Hobby and Intercontinental airports. I know you connect through up there. And uh, I, I actually took this photo of my buddy Pierce Sellers on, our, on my first mission. And so you see the, uh, the earth back there. We're actually in the cargo bay of the shuttle. That is the uh, thermal protection system samples we were testing the repair on. And I call it my selfie. This is actually Pierce. I took the picture, though, because if you look close, right in the middle of the helmet, you see that? That's, that's, that's me in the reflection. So, see, so, I, <laughs> so that's my selfie. And, uh, okay, 
uh, when you have free time, the, 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 the favorite thing to do was look out the windows. And this, this cluster of windows was fairly new. It wasn't there when I was on the shuttle mission, so it was new when I was up there for space station. And it's a little misleading because it's not on top of the space station. It's actually on the bottom of the space station. So that, that's what it looks like from another angle. So you have to look up in order to look down. And it actually becomes perfectly normal and natural to do that as you're flying in there, flying through the station, and then go down and open the covers and see the Earth below. Here's what it looks like from the inside with me silhouetted against uh, the ocean out there. And uh, why, again, do you want to look out the windows? Because you can see things like this. This is one of the last shuttles with the, uh, the Earth coming by, kind of a, 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 a night shot that captures those stars. This is a, sh a picture I took of the very last space shuttle leaving the space station, giving a little salute with that arm over the uh, cargo bay. Uh, yeah, I broke some rules. I got yelled at. Advanced size. Tell him thanks. Uh, I also got this picture of the last space shuttle re-entering. That, see that little little bit there? It's actually the, the space shuttle is re-entering the atmosphere, dragging, I call it dragging, but leaving a plasma, glowing plasma trail in the, uh, in the dark sky. It was so cool to get that. Nobody had actually captured that on film before, so it was really exciting for me to get it. Uh, other things you can see, I took that photo too. That's the aurora. Um, the, the, the green is the aurora australis, or the southern lights, uh, and the red above it is the aurora that reaches all the way up to our altitude, which is very disturbing the first time you realize we're flying into it. I, you know, I'm watching this green pulsing river down there below us as we're going into it. I was just, mouth is just hanging open. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. And I look and I say, wait a minute, the red's up to our altitude. We're going to be flying into it. Is it going to hurt? Do I need to protect myself or something? And I thought I might hear something, but no, nothing. Uh, there's another, uh, uh, just another kind of a detailed shot of that aurora. This is particles streaming in from the sun near the poles that, that excite the, uh, uh, the, the, the glowing of the upper atmosphere. Uh, this, the scientists were kind of excited about this one because not only did I get the green and the red, but a little blush of a purple blue-purple aurora that's kind of rare. Uh, other things, hey, I grew up on the Gulf Coast too, hurricanes. I, I know what they're like underneath. They're strangely beautiful from above when you see this swirling you know, pinwheel and you can see down into the eye itself, but I know what's going on underneath, and so it's still pretty scary to me. Uh, you can see things like fires because you see the smoke. You don't see the fire directly from 250 miles, but you can see this plume of smoke, and this was actually at Los Alamos uh, in uh, New Mexico. Uh, you see the plumes of smoke from multiple fires in Africa coming across the Atlantic Ocean, or a dust storm on the Sahara, which is kicking up and blurring the coastline with all of the yellow, and then you see this yellow smear across the Atlantic coming to uh, Brownsville. A lot of it's intercepted in the southern United States. You guys have had your, your your weather obscured by Saharan dust before. Now, what I'd really like to do is look out at night and take pictures at night and stuff, because at night you can see where civilized, industrialized humanity lives. Any guesses where we are here? Egypt. Perfect. Who had that? Yeah. Yep. That we're over the Mediterranean. Mediterranean. That's the Nile River. The Nile Delta, Red Sea, the little, little bit of communities along it. Interesting that Israel in that uh, particular neighborhood has lights on. Neighbors, not so much. Uh, but just the kind of beautiful things you can see. And really flying over the Rio Grande Valley in the daytime, it's hard to find. It really is. You, but at night, you could see the cities lined up along the, uh, right along the border and stuff, really delineated. Um, and and you, you can see the highway because there's lights along it up to San Antonio, Austin, Big Dallas, Little Fort Worth, and, uh, you know, et cetera like that to really find the places you know. And there was even a, a moment on my very first space shuttle flight when I was looking out the window by myself uh, at, right toward the end of our mission, and I looked out and realized we're right over Israel the, with the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, there and it was a, it was a very spiritual moment for me as I realized how much of our 
world's religions are centered in that kind of precious, rare piece of uh, earth. This picture was taken just a couple of weeks ago um, by one of the crew that just turned. That's, uh, this is Galveston. Uh, here you could see the causeway so clearly, Texas City Dyke. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I think I've zoomed in. That's, ooh, zoomed too far. That's actually my campus in Galveston of uh, the Texas a &M University right here with our big ship, 540-foot training ship at the dock. <laughs> it was pretty cool to see, uh, you know, that coming down. Well, after the almost six months in space, we were, had, it was finally time to come home, so we, uh, we put our official mission patch sticker up on the station, and, uh, and then we could pack a few personal items and come home. We landed pre-dawn in Kazakhstan two days before Thanksgiving in 2011, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, had a quick uh, ceremony there. And, and anyway, I'm going to jump straight to a video I've got. Let's see it. One more click. Okay, so it's about a six-minute video showing the, the whole mission. After two and a half years of training, we're in Kazakhstan now getting ready to launch. So we're suiting up. We go report into the big Russian space boss, and about three hours later, we're lighting up the night sky. It was a, a very smooth, very nice ride going uphill. It's tight, though. You see, how we're actually hip to hip and elbow to elbow. This is not like a big roomy or you know, dragon or, uh, or space shuttle. Two days later, we could get around and move some, but two days later, we're coming in to dock to the space station. Once we get physically docked, we gotta spend some time doing pressure seal checks and stuff before we can open the hatches and come barreling across to greet the, uh, the crew that's waiting for us. Then we uh, gathered in the uh, uh, Russian part of the station to do a video conference. Our families had gone from Kazakhstan to Moscow. We got to say hi to them, and then it's time to get to work on over two, you know, on all those experiments. Biological samples go in the minus 80 degree freezer. We're doing things like looking at our eyeballs too, to looking at for structure, changes to the retina, changes to the optic nerve. A lot of what we did was getting ready for that. The last space shuttle came up and docked while we were there. So while they were there, my buddy Ron and I suited up for our fourth spacewalk together. And, uh, you know, what an amazing adventure out there, looking in the back window of that space shuttle. And another six and a half hour spacewalk. It was great to get it done safely and not drop anything or uh, embarrass yourself in some way. The medical stuff continues. Satoshi's doing an ultrasound of his eyeball and the optic nerve. There we're drawing blood from each other and, and then enjoying dinner. Uh, by this time, we were down to a crew of three. We were waiting on the second half of my crew to get there. We had the first humanoid robot in space. He's on the left. That's how you exercise with a harness and bungee to hold you to the treadmill. You see it moving. No, there are no showers in space. Soapy water and a washcloth for six months, and that's a sleeping bag. I tied mine to the wall. Um, Work besides that, it's working on systems. Every once in a while, the car, Russian cargo ships would bring up. You saw us, we had some fresh stuff. That was actually onions that we've sliced up and we're eating them like slices of apple, which I never thought I'd do, but it was just tasted so good to have something crunchy that tasted like earth. What not all work and no play. Satoshi liked to play baseball when he was a kid and he got so good in space, he could pitch the ball and beat it to the batter's box. Watch this. Batter up Satoshi. He even got good enough to field his own hits. Can you guys try that? <laughs> you know, we talk about, about floating in space, but you're not just floating. You're actually flying. You just grab on to the sides, push off, and try not to hit anything expensive. Ooh, <laughs> we're cheap. You squirt some water out, and it just forms a sphere with surface tension, pulling it together. Exploring the space station is fun because it's about the size of 12 school buses or the internal volume of a 747 or did I hear five bedroom house? I like that one. It makes sense. Here I'm preparing to capture this time sequence photos. Look at that. 
That's what it's like to fly over that aurora. Now, we're not moving that fast. This is individual photos that have been put together to make a false video. I couldn't describe the, the aurora or what it's like to fly over Japan at night with the squid fishing fleet offshore, but it's so exciting to be able to show you that. Uh, finally, Dan and his guys got there, and uh, we had four days to hand over a $100 billion space station, so we didn't sleep much. We got it handed over. We could bring about two pounds of personal items home, climbed into the spacecraft. This, again, is in late November, just a few days before Thanksgiving. And, uh, and then as our ship was re-entering, parts of it are burning up. We're in a little spark right in the middle that's protected by the heat shield. We landed under parachute pre-dawn. It was a rough landing. We hit once, we bounced, we hit again, and then got dragged behind the chute for a ways. That's what it looks like to get 200 pounds of dead weight out of a spaceship. And then they're all worried about us getting cold, piling all these blankets on and stuff. I mean, we weren't worried about getting cold. We had just ridden home in a meteor. It's all scorched. That's what it looked like just after they got the hatch open. We had a short helicopter ride, and then we did that funny hat ceremony. I have no idea what that was about. 24 hours later, the NASA airplane was landing at Ellington Field, south of Houston, just right by my house. So I got to, got home just in time to eat turkey and dressing with my family. What do you think? That looked like an adventure? You bet. Thank you very much. I, I look, look forward to taking any questions when we get the panel going. Or did you? Okay, I've got a few minutes. If anybody wants to hit me with some questions right now, I'd love to. Yes. The most exciting part, oh man, I can't narrow it down. Uh, launches and landings, they're, they're intense because like a space shuttle sitting on the ground weighed about four and a half million pounds. Four million pounds of that was explosives. Anybody that's not a little concerned doesn't know what's going on. You know, but you got a job to do. I'm, I, I made a joke about being a 12-year-old fist pumping, but that was only about 2% of what I was doing. Most of the time I, I'm trained and, and you get, they really, uh, you know, work you hard in training to make sure you're ready for any emergencies and stuff. And so you're always waiting for something to go wrong because it always does in the simulator. And, you know, if, if things go really, really, really bad, it's going to all be done real fast. Can't do much about it, but I want... If I can trap it, if I could see a pressure changing or something going wrong, I want to be able to, you know, start taking action, you know, while we can. Um, and the other thing was probably spacewalking. I'm incredibly psyched up to do the spacewalks. My first one was, you know, it was just intense going out of the hatch the first time. I'm hanging on the hatch. You know, I've trained for this for how many hours? Hundreds of hours underwater. I had over 600 hours underwater doing spacewalk training. And I, I helped design a lot of the tools and techniques that were being used, but it was so different for me to be the one going out and doing it. The senior guy, Pierce, was out first. He made sure our safety tethers were there. But I remember coming out feet first and hanging on this handrail, just looking at, at this space station up there. It's like so different from what I trained on in the water. And there were no friendly scuba divers there to keep, the, to keep me safe. And, uh, and I looked at the space station reflecting the Earth. I didn't look down yet, and there's my space shuttle hanging off the edge. And then I looked down. That was a mistake. Don't look down. <laughs> and uh, I, look, I, I looked up. I know my face just showed sheer terror. I looked up at my buddy Piers, and he's, he was laughing and inside his helmet at me. And I says, okay. Piers is laughing. He's smiling. We're not about to die. Okay. Focus. Focus. I guess over here, yeah. Okay. Well, line up for questions. You bet. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Lee Sierra. I want to ask you what experience has carried you uh, to your success? Uh, any memorable moment, life lesson, or would you like to share? So, uh, the, the overall question about how'd you get here? Yeah. It's success in life. Uh, you know, and, and, and I think it's the, the big one is just really being taught from a young age. It's up to us. You know, we've got it, you know, there, there's, you know, I, I grew up in the same kind of neighborhood you grew up in. It, you know, it was, you know, sometimes tough out there. Um, and, 
you know, and, and I, I also knew that it was, you know, that, that it's real easy for people to say no. Real people, real easy for people to laugh and say you can't or, or you shouldn't. But to get to yes is hard. And to understand no doesn't mean never. It means not yet. And to get rejected by NASA so many times and go through that year and a half long process of getting built up, year and a half long application process, all the, the whole thing, and then to get the gut kick that, you know, you didn't get selected. You didn't get selected again, again, again. You didn't even get interviewed one time. No, the, those, you know, but it's like, I'm, you know, so keep, keep leaning forward. And the other thing really, and it's really key to me, and I think it was key to my eventual success getting in the door at NASA, and when I was interviewing Frank and Jasmine and some of the astronauts you've seen on the screen today as part of their selection committee, I'm looking for how they, what makes them tick inside. And, you know, and it, it's that, that passion. Are they really enjoying their path? And that's really key. If somebody comes in and says, all I've ever wanted to do is an astronaut and I, there's, there's nothing else I can do or I want to do, it's like, no, that's, that's not healthy. Okay, so I enjoyed what I was doing. And I, when I left, when I left the Air Force, I mean, I loved what I was doing in the Air Force. I moved back not to get selected by NASA. I really had to get my kids back to their grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and stuff like that. I needed to settle down. If NASA wasn't going to hire me as an astronaut, move me here. I'll just leave and I'll come here. And I, but I really a gut check. Will I be happy working at NASA with these colleagues that I have worked with in flight tests that are and interviewed with that are now astronauts and I'm not. And I, I, I really, I spent a lot of time in prayer and meditation before I stepped into that because I, it would be, it, it could just tear you up with uh, jealousy and stuff. But so it's enjoying the path and being knowing you know, when, when Jasmine and Frank were selected, we had 18,000 applicants. Yeah, we picked 12. You know, that's not 17,988 losers. You know, they're incredibly accomplished people that are at the top of their career from roughly 28 to 44 years old that are at the top of the line in the, in the military, aviation, medicine, engineering, sciences and stuff that are doing great things all over our country. But how do you the 12 rise to the top? And, and it's, it's hard. So you've got to enjoy the path you're on. Because if you don't really enjoy, and don't go be a mechanical engineer, because Mike was a mechanical engineer. And if, if you don't like gears and torsion and stuff, if you like rocks, then go be a, a great geologist. You'd stand out as one of the best. And that's the key. You, you can't do something you're not really passionate about and be the best at it. Not the best, not nationwide best. You can be really good, but if to be the best, it's got to be something that really lights you up. Like my son, he, that wanted to do nuclear power. And he said, I'm going to change the world because we're going we're gonna to develop this kind of a small modular reactor that's going to really change the equation for CO2 emissions and everything else. And that drove him with an incredible passion we've never seen before. And he succeeded. So harness the passion and don't give up. You're going to fall on your face. You're not beaten until you don't get back up again. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, I want to say uh, first, uh, thank you for, for um, your, your incredible experiences. Um, as well as, as really investing in our community and okay. in trying to raise up curiosity for the next generation. Um, you know, uh, a, a lot of us might, might look up at your experiences and say that's quite far away. Yeah. Uh, m many, many years of, of steps that you've taken sure. to get to where you are today. Um, to, to young folks that might be interested in following a similar kind of path, how would you recommend that first step? You bet. You, but start by exploring here. I mean, I was introduced to the night skies at Camp Perry at by Rio Hondo, the Boy Scout camp. I, you know, I took an astronomy merit badge and my head was blown. I had studied some of those things in the books, but I hadn't really studied them in the night sky. And I ended up teaching the 
astronomy merit badge there a, a lot. And I've taught it to scouts for the last 50 years uh, because it, it's, I, you know, anyway. Um, and, and so start by exploring right here. Get and, 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 and explore your, what, what, it, what interests you, particularly if you're still in school, in high school and stuff here, you've got amazing, you know, uh, teachers and, and, and resources here in Brownsville to explore different ideas. And, and I started off in the wrong major in college too, because I didn't know anything about engineering and I just kind of picked one and I realized I was in the wrong one. And I went around to talk to the different engineering departments and there was no internet, so I had to walk around to go talk to them. And, uh, and then when they started talking to me about mechanical, it went ding, 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 ding. Oh, I like that. Um, and, um, you know, and, and so explore different ideas. Don't be afraid to dream. Do ask questions, lots of questions. Because everybody in this room, for these students, they want to help you. And they will, if they don't know anybody, if they don't know personally what it is you're asking about, they will find somebody to put you in touch with that can help you understand and explore, you know, this idea that you've got. And listen to that voice. Spend a little time thinking uh, and, uh, you know, a little less time on these. And, uh, you know, and, and th that, that, that give you an opportunity to reflect, to meditate. And when these ideas come to you, follow them, follow up on them, read about them. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, for, for all of my kids, you know, really, they, they, a, a passion lit them up at some point, And I didn't have anything to do with any of them. But I did teach them, you know, to, to reach, to explore, to do your own thing. And I had to learn that with my daughter because she was brilliant in math and I was sure she was going to be an outstanding engineer. And she got accepted to schools all over the country. And we're visiting one of them and she said, Dad, I'm going to throw myself off the roof. That's pretty drastic, honey. She says, I, will not, I do not want to study engineering. Well, then let's find something else, okay? But she had to know herself well enough to realize not to let her old man push her into something she didn't really want to do. She found a way to use her gifts and put her husband through medical school and put a down payment on a house in a few years. So, you know, so they got to find their own path, but ask questions. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. We got one more. Hi, and my I'm, name is Valeria and I find it super cool that you're here presenting to us. And my question for you was, what kind of training did you have to do beforehand in order to be able to go into space? A lifetime of training, a lifetime, really. I, I mean, but it was, you know, once it, it, at NASA, they start you, you know, when you started learning the space shuttle, you know, and stuff, it starts off in a classroom, just like the ones you're in. It's just moving really fast. And we had tests that were actually graded to make sure we're taking them seriously. And, and I, to me, I was astonished that they have to because this isn't a game anymore. This is serious. You can die if you don't do this stuff right. I mean, seriously. So, it, but to take it seriously, and once you, you're learning stuff in the class, and then they had these little simulators that just did one or two things, small things. And then the simulators got bigger and bigger until it was a full mission simulator, not just with one or two people, but with you know five of them in the simulator. And then, then not just us in the simulator, but the mission control team in training in, a, in another mission control room that was just for training. You saw the one that we're working in, but, and now they're training the flight controllers at the same time they're training the crew members, and there's this very evil training team in the middle that throws problems at, and we got to solve them between the cockpit and the mission control training room. And so it gets more and more complex. Similar for, for robotics training, classroom training, then simulator training. And then very intense uh, qualification exams, practical exams, where you had to do all of robotic in a simulator. But if you bump something, some, as some astronauts never pass. And some never flew because they couldn't do the robotics or they couldn't do the spacewalk training, same thing. Uh, so lots of buildup, you know, in addition to the medical training, you know, so I did, I, I, I prepped patients in an OR which is pretty scary as an engineer, but 
you know, so I was crew medical officer on my flight. So, you know, if, if we trained for a lot of stuff. I worked at an ER and uh, Herman Memorial Trauma ER in downtown Houston as a graduation exercise. That was pretty scary. Uh, but, you know, it's just building, building your knowledge base, building your confidence. And we fly the jets just as a way of doing something that's actually dangerous, that requires team coordination, judgment, uh, decision making and stuff, which is why we fly the T-38 jets too. So it's a lot, what I loved about it, we did geology training in the New Mexico desert, and they're going to other places now that we're getting serious about going to Mars. But uh, I mean, going back to the moon, I love that kind of stuff too. So no day is the same. They're all different. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, awesome. Always oh, the coolest guy in the room. He talked about that selfie that Science Magazine claims to be one of the greatest selfies ever done. The originator of the selfie right there. And it's up in the Houston airport and everywhere else. So we're going to try to do one with you guys because you guys are pretty cool too. And maybe it won't be in the Houston airport, but we got a mayor here. Maybe he'll stick it in the Brownsville airport. So let's try a selfie of the colonel up there. All of you guys up in front. And it's going to be a selfie with the students of the Brownsville Independent School District with Colonel Mike Fossum. Um, yeah. yeah, let's see if we can get this. Um, oh, you got you to come in. You yeah, come in. you got to come in. You want him in? Yeah. All right, all right. Uh, we need our mayor because we want to make sure it gets put up in the Brownsville airport. I mean, because he's a great mayor. <laughs> All right, come on, guys. Let's get a good selfie. This way you can stretch. You've been sitting a while. Come on, sweetheart. Right up here in front. Can we get our little our uh, elementary kiddos? Oh, yeah. Where do you want them? Where do you want them? Wherever he wants to be. He's the mayor. <laughs> No, you're doing a selfie and they're taking that one from the back. Yeah, yeah, okay. I don't need my selfie plug on here. Uh, Are you going to be able to get the selfie in? Crunch in, all the way. There's no space. Crunch, 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 crunch. crunch, 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 crunch. Yes, yes. Get all the students in here. Let's go. Come on, guys. All right. Okay, is everybody in? Mike, it's supposed to be a selfie. Oh, it's supposed to be a selfie. Okay. <laughs> And then we'll do some other. Let's get all these guys back up. Come on, guys. Tight. Are y'all in? Can you get them all in? Oh. <laughs> okay, now you this is the normal one if you like, but I just want to make sure everybody stretched and got to move. That's all right. Whatever you want. I knew I wanted to do that. I was yeah. Gonna... All right. It's okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. That got you moving a little bit. Stretch. You can go back to your homes over here in your chairs. We're good. With me? Sure. Yeah, Oh, shit. Uh, Colonel Fossil will take personal selfies with you later. Test. Check, check, test, 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 test. Test, test.
All right, give it up one more time for Colonel Michael Paul. So for the next half an hour, for the, the final part of this event, we're going to do a, a panel. We're going to do a panel discussion with the four uh, really talented people that had spoken on the stage earlier. Uh, this is going to be the Pathways to Careers in STEM and Space panel. So you all, most of you, are, are in high school and you're you know, at the point where you're thinking about the next step, you're thinking about where you're going to go. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the main objectives of the South Texas Astronomical Society is to to show you the kind of pathways that are available and to connect you with people like these people on stage who are on those pathways right now so that because you don't you won't be able to know what to do and where to go um, until somebody else does it and you can follow their path and you can hear their advice and tips and uh, take from it what you will and then you know pave your own unique path. So on this panel we're gonna have the opportunity to talk to some extremely talented individuals um, who are all on different but very ambitious uh, trajectories. So we have Jacqueline Benya, who is from here. She just graduated. And she <laughs> she didn't mention it earlier because she is too humble, but she uh, graduated just recently from Pace and is now starting uh, her career uh, in aerospace engineering at Stanford University. And then we have Richard Camuccio, who is currently in the process of getting his PhD within the first class of PhD uh, recipients for physics at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. We talked about the observatory and stuff, but the work he's doing in astrophysics is really cutting edge revolutionary stuff, and, and it's really awesome. Um, like they mentioned that you know we have a lot going on here in Brownsville, and a lot of opportunities to be a part of it. Then we have Alex Zamora, who started in Brownsville and is now working every day. He gets to go to the world famous Johnson Space Center Mission Control at NASA. And then, of course, Colonel Michael Fossum, who is one of under 300 humans on the Earth to have had the privilege to work and live and eat food and play games on the International Space Station. Alright, so I'm going to get this started and ask the first question and then we'll take turns answering and then I want you all to, to ask questions too. You could raise your hand, I'll walk around uh, with the microphone and we have another one on that side. So just raise your hand if you have a question and we'll get to that. But we'll start it off with this question. What was it that first inspired you to, to pursue a career in space and or STEM? For me, it was. For me, it was getting to work with. Um, um, so participating in events like this, getting to hear from, talking to different people, it's hard not to get inspired. Um, I think it was just looking at it overall as a whole and saying I want to be a part of something bigger. And unlike all the amazing, talented individuals here, um, my path isn't defined yet. But um, starting that journey. For me, I think it was specifically when I was five years old, I looked through a telescope for the first time with my dad on the driveway uh, at the moon and at Saturn. And I think it was two specific insights. Um, one was knowing that those are not things on the sky, but they're places you can go. Um, and then the other insight was that, uh, well, what are the stars? And realizing that the sun is just a really close by star. And those two very simple yet profound insights at a young age, I think, sent me on this journey to where I am today. So 
So I think for me, just big picture, I was always into like sci-fi movies and different things like that. So not like on a super serious note, uh, like for me, I think kind of the movies really inspired me. And then like some of my other friends up here on stage, just astronomy just really opened that door and piqued my interest. So for me, that was what inspired me for, to pursue aerospace. And you heard from me some, I, when we first uh, moved to the valley, we lived, I, I went and actually born in McAllen. We lived out in the country uh, for a period of time and I, before I started school. And I remember, I just loved the natural world. And for me, it was exploring, uh, figuring out the ways of rattlesnakes, black widow spiders, javelinas. Uh, and, and when I got to school, there was all this cool stuff, uh, cool pictures of, uh, of science, of the natural world, in, in these things they called books. And that's why I, had to, I was in a passion to learn how to read, because I wanted to, I wanted to know what was in those books. So I've always been attracted to the natural world. And also, as, as, as perhaps uh, uh, you might infer from my interest in learning the ways of rattlesnakes and black widow spiders, I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie. And I like thrills. I like roller coasters and stuff at a young age. And so, like flying supersonic jets and spacecraft and spacewalking, yeah, that's a, that that's the kind of thing. But even a career that has challenges and risks, uh, even if it's not a physical risk. Now, as I you know, part of university administration, uh, and uh, and even you know, working in a six-story engine room with my cadets, uh, you know, on the Atlantic Ocean, uh, the the. Uh, in the summer times is part of the adrenaline for me too. I like action. I don't. I never want to, you know, work in a cubicle. I'll take it as the most senior, old, the oldest person up here, I guess, because, you know, I'm probably, I may be on, you know, my last job or last one or two, who knows. But what I do now to get me excited and passionate about, I lived the dream that I had I, as, a, as an 11 year old, dreamed of flying in space. In the years that followed, it, I refined it. I worked with some buddies, one of whom I had dinner with two nights ago, to turn a, a treehouse into our space station. I was a weird kid. I lived about live. I, 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 as I, before we were flying the, the Skylab uh, space station, I'd heard about the space station that we had in the mid 70s, and I was dreaming about living on a space station at a young age. And so I, I, I literally did everything I dreamed about doing. And uh, I never thought I'd leave NASA, but that's what really encouraged me to take another risk. And in a way, it was my job was easy. I was still on flight status. I could still go again, but I'd been there. Um, and I had I spent another five years or so helping train the next astronauts, supporting launch operations in uh, uh, pre, pre, pre-launch operations in Russia, and then going to Kazakhstan with crews and their families and stuff. And I loved what I was doing, but the opportunity to to really be a, a, a university leader, to work with young people, uh, like perhaps you in a couple of years, you know, that are, that are pursuing their dreams. To me, that, that ignited another passion in me that I've always had, which is why I've been a lifelong, or in my entire adult life, I've been a volunteer in the scouting program, and I still very, very strongly believe in the scouting program, and I'm proud of the Rio Grande Council down here. Uh, and, and the difference that they made in my life, that pro- scouting probably saved my life because I was in a, to a little too much adrenaline in uh, unproductive and unsafe ways. And they, they helped me find uh, other good outlets for it. So for me, it's the challenge uh, still. And I get an adrenaline rush out of working with the uh, Congress, with, uh, with working at the Texas legislature, with uh, you know fighting to get a new ship from from my maritime cadets, and I got it in April after we didn't have one for 18 years. I need a challenge, and we got it. So 
So for me, I think the thing that keeps me going is something in my mind that I just sort of call the power of one more. So especially like at work and stuff, you know, you're always, you're, you have like this base minimum expectation that you're there to meet, but then there's always one more thing you can do. There's another project you can take on. There's somebody else that you can mentor. There's somebody you can take with you. And I think to just echo some of uh, Colonel Fossum's words earlier, which is you just, you have to love what you do. And you, if you're passionate about it, you're just gonna go extremely hard for it. You're gonna do everything that you can. And by no means is it a straight shot every time, right? I am no stranger to failure. What, you, what I've talked about today were like the high points, but there's been equally, if not worse, failures for me. So if I had any advice to give anybody just starting off is don't be afraid to fail. And if you fail, fail hard and learn everything you can from it because I've learned the most through all of my failures. I was gonna say something kind of similar so I can follow up is that find yourself in a position where you're constantly learning and challenging yourself. Right? You, as long as you are learning new things, uh, you're constantly growing. You're going to be making mistakes along the way. Um, I'm in a PhD program, but I got rejected from all of the graduate schools I first applied to. So the first time I applied to graduate school, I didn't get in. Uh, my, my failures have also taught me uh, quite a bit as well. So I would say if you're um, interested in doing something in you know, science or engineering, challenging yourself constantly, constantly learning, and really, if there are a few problems in the world that you're really interested in solving, try focusing on those and try to make a difference in the world. That's really, uh, those are the key things for me at least. Um, just adding to that, uh, specifically being a lot younger and starting barely, um, the inspirational part about all of this is knowing that the field that you're going into is constantly developing. There are schools that need to be reached. Um, like they say, it starts with the moon, then it goes on to Mars, and you're never just really going to be bored. Um, looking at what you want to do in the future, even just answering that question alone, um, there's no definite answer. Just because now I could say I want to work for a specific company, um, I want to do something specific with a certain rocket, um, I won't know what that looks like in a couple years, and that's just the exciting part of all of it. I guess my first question would be to you, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, what would be, what would be the best advice you would give to somebody who is trying to pursue uh, an education in aerospace engineering and pursuing a bachelor's at Stanford University, which has actually been my dream since I was, uh, as far as I can remember. Oh, that, that's a really good question, specifically because you're from here. Um, there's a bunch of people you can talk to who are doing the sort of thing that you might want to do. Um, Getting to Stanford, it's a lot of this idea that you're on the frontier. It's that this school is where we make the next big thing. These are the people who are leading the future. And so when you apply, when you talk to the people that you, you want to be working with, they're looking for that certain spark, um, you're thinking of the future. So as long as you keep that in mind, um, make connections while you're here. Talk about that in your application. Talk about that with the people um, at school. It, it'll get you to where you need to be. Right. I think so. On your journey to becoming like who you are, have you ever made a mistake? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it, 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 and, and I think that the, the mistakes, uh, you know, not, not in the technical world, but in how I handled things. And, uh, you know, I, at, at one point in my career er, er, early on, you know, I had a boss who was a terrible bully. I mean, he was just vicious. And I won't go into details. 
But I didn't know how to handle that. And, you know, and I really withdrew and I was afraid of him and that's what he wanted. And it, it really belittled me. It, it held me back. And I ended up, you know, kind of, I figured I'd kind of reached a dead end because he had blocked me from actually advancing in my career. And, uh, and I, I was really upset about it. And, but two things happened. One is I started exploring options and that's when I applied to Air Force Test Pilot School. Part of it was this astronaut dream, maybe, but part of it was to get away from a toxic boss. So there's, there's more effective ways to handle it. So fast forward a few years, and I, I was out of test pilot school. I was doing great work, and I ran into another problem with a boss who was treating me kind of similarly. And I put up with it, you know, he was, you know, he came in new to the, to the group I was with. And, uh, you know, after a couple of months, I said, I've either got to leave, you know, or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go crazy here. And I decided to talk to him about it, which I didn't really do with the first guy. And I just stopped by one afternoon and on a Friday afternoon said, hey, you know, boss, I know you're busy. And I just want to say I've worked for you for a couple of months here. And I think it's time for us to have a chat, feedback session and stuff. Not today, next week sometime. I'll see you. And he's, he's growling behind the desk. And I walked out and said, well, I might not be working here much longer. And uh, the next week I caught him. And, uh, you know, I caught him and, and, and he said, Oh, you ready ready for that chat? And I said, sure. And I thought, here goes. And uh, you know, and we ended up having a wonderful conversation. He was uh, bragging on me how good I was doing, the team I was running and everything, completely changed our relationship. And we are good friends to this day. That took place back in 1986. And, and we're good, very good friends to this day because I addressed the problem instead of just avoiding it. And so that was the biggest mistake that I made. And it's one that I still struggle with some because most of us would rather avoid conflict than, than address it head on. But I, I always go back to remembering, even now in my job as a vice president of Texas A&M, you got to address the conflict. And, and even though most of us would rather avoid it, by only, you can only make it better by addressing it. And sometimes the conflict evaporates completely and you realize it was just a misunderstanding. Yeah, those are good words, uh, Colonel Faso. That really resonated with me because I have dealt with something similar to that in the past, so I appreciate that uh, from my perspective. But to answer the question of, you know, how you have, how have my failures sort of defined me? I feel like my failures have never really defined me. It's more been my reactions to them and how I get up from them. So for me, I've kind of internalize this phrase of, it's not really what happens to me, it's how I react. So just kind of controlling myself, how uh, I really react to something, and to me, even if that involves like sleeping on it or something, and having those uncomfortable conversations uh, truly does dispel a lot of the miscommunication or the lack thereof of communication. So I wouldn't say my failures define me, but it's how you come back from them that really do define you as a person. No. Well, you're perfect. How you react to the failure. I, I had a massive mess up when I was working in the deep classified world in Nevada and flight tests. And I, you know, it was working much of the time in, in vaults because it was all highly classified stuff. And I, I slept at work two or three nights a week just because to you, you, you had a lot to do. And, uh, and I, came in one morning and found out that the vault that I had been in the night before had been found open. And the team was waiting for me to come in and I said, Mike, were you in that vault last night? Oh no. You know, and it was a it was massive security violation. Now we were living in a very classified place inside of a classified place, et cetera. So, but the first thing I did was walk into my boss's office. Cause this is a, this is a firing offense. And, uh, and I walked into my boss's office and I said, boss, I screwed up and you got to own it. And because I owned it, you know, he didn't take my head off. 
He said, well, let's, you know, they did an investigation to confirm nobody else had been in the area that wasn't cleared for that particular vault. But I, I, I owned it. When you mess up, if you try to make excuses, and I've seen this happen a lot, they're gone. Just own it. They all know you did it. And that included making mistakes on orbit. I wasn't the perfect crew member, you know. I made mistake, massive mistakes up there, some you guys probably still talk about. Uh, when, you, when you're training new crews, but when you just say, I screwed up, I missed that, I did it wrong, then you can move on. We've had crew members that denied throwing the wrong switch, and we spent many, many, many hours trying to figure out how that thing happened without the crew member flipping the switch, and in the end, we all know he threw the wrong switch and could have saved us a lot of time if it, they just admitted it. I mean, in terms of mistakes, I can't say much different, but in terms of ownership, right? Uh, when you make a mistake, taking ownership of it is going to be the surest way to learn from those mistakes. Um, or in other words, uh, I feel like this is an old proverb somewhere, but it's like you can't control the storm, but you can adjust the sails. So your reaction, I'm really reiterating a lot of things because they're, I can't say it better, but um, you know, your mistakes, uh, don't have to define you, but um, they're the only way that you'll grow. Uh, learning how to react to when you've been working so hard and let's say you've gone under an intense process, maybe you're trying to apply to a dream job or you're trying to get a position or something that you've been striving for and maybe the door doesn't open when you knock. Maybe you have to knock 10 times. Maybe you have to try different avenues, but if you find yourself uh, reacting in, in when, when, you re when you basically receive a no, you'll see who you truly are. You'll either say, well, how can I work this problem? How can I go around this? How can I find an alternative path? So, and those are really, that's like the healthy type of mentality that you want to have when you're challenging yourself and you'll inevitably reach problems that you can't solve. You have to uh, work them and, and learn from them that way, so. I'm sure any sort of mistake you could make right now as a high school student will not be as scary as a security breach or <laughs> anything on that end, but you could start with your, giving yourself that grace. Um, but you're at the age where you're learning your lessons. Um, these are lessons to be taught and told. Um, this is something you're gonna look back at and say, well, when I was young, I did something and it did not really work out. Um, you're building your own perspective right now and setting yourself up for success. So just being a little lighthearted at this age is good for you. Hi, good morning. Thank you for um, sharing your journey with us. My name is Daphne Maldonado and I'm the director for the Convention and Visitors Bureau and Office of Space Commerce. And it's the newest department with the city of Brownsville. We're developing it right now and I would like to know what would you like to see come to fruition Brownsville space commercialization. Oh boy, I'm not. I, well, I think that your 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 neighbors over in Boca Chica are probably getting ahead of you. I, I'm not sure. You know, what? Else, I'd love to sit down and have a cup of coffee. It won't be today because I've got to leave in a few minutes. But uh, to to think about what ideas you've got there, it it's incredible to have. I mean, star star base out there, it, you know, the, the work that SpaceX is doing at Boca Chica right here, it's unimaginable to me. Actually, when they, when they bought that land um, a number of years ago, I thought it was, uh, it was a negotiation tactic to use with Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Like, well, give us better rates or we're gonna build our own. Like, there's no way they're gonna build their own. You know how expensive it is to build all that stuff, to put all that infrastructure in place? And here we are, right? Because they, you know, so, but it's, it's, it's right here. I mean, when I graduated from high school, there were no engineering programs. You know, there were very few t really technical programs at the bachelor's degree or, or, or above available anywhere in the valley. And now there's all of these things. And, you know, we've got, the, you know, the observatories. How many of them here in Brownsville? Well, t two big ones and the smaller ones and stuff. Uh, so there's... I mean, those kind of options, they open things up. I, 
I, I think probably your best bet for the short term is tying into what's already gone on at Boca Chica. It's hard to land rockets. I'm not sure I'd recommend it at your airport. Uh, let them do it out there where there's a little less around. Uh, and certainly launching, you want to be on the coast, so you're going over as few people as possible. Uh, but figuring out how to be the, uh, the, the, the part of the support network that ties into the, the, the groundbreaking that they're doing is probably the first guess. I don't necessarily have too much to add, I'm sorry, but I do think that there is one big thing, at least in my perspective, is like we don't, we didn't get here alone, right? We all have our, our families, our support systems, different things like that. And I know from a personal position that it's, it's difficult to get your family to get up and move somewhere else and there only just be something there for you. And that is like a backbreaking thing, right? It's a deal breaker for a lot of people. So I think bolstering the, I guess, sorry, bolstering the job market for not just space, but other things, I think would benefit not only Brownsville as a community, but also invite more of that commercialization for other companies to come in and invest here and settle down here. Yeah, just again to piggyback off of that, I know that there's so many like students at the universities and at the different high schools, you know, Jackie had a satellite project that if it had a little bit of funding, that could be a real thing that's launched off of a Starship, for instance. So um, there's a lot of uh, ideas and a lot of people who have these ideas that don't know where to necessarily go to make them real. And so if we could somehow tie those resources together, but we have the, you know, we have the expertise to teach um, if we could somehow have a pathway for more students to take their ideas and actually make them real, we have one, we're one of the few places in the world where we have the resources right in our, in our neighborhood to do these things, so I think we should capitalize on them. Oh my gosh, okay, so um, I like this question. So I hope to see it implemented for the better, um, specifically for a pillar of inspiration. I know Richard's moment was looking through a telescope while my moment was watching the Starship launch. And, I mean, it's the most powerful rocket ever. And it's 30 minutes down the road, Boca Chica. So I hope that you guys get to see one sometime soon in the future. Um, and this is the engineering of the future beyond Artemis generation, and you guys are looking at Mars. Um, you're looking at the, uh, the human, land, human landing system being built right there. So I hope this inspires you guys. It inspired a lot of us here. Um, so yeah, I really hope that it's implemented correctly, mainly for that point. I think we'll take our last question. Salila uh, from PACE and my question for all of you guys are if you can go back in time uh, what would you do differently or what would you change and, so, and if so why? It's a very good question. I don't have anything exciting. I mean, I, the one thing that came to mind was maybe I should have become an Eagle Scout. I feel like that. <laughs> I, I, well, I heard that Colonel Fossum was one, and you know, um, all the Apollo astronauts were, were Eagle Scouts, so that was the first thing that came to mind. Maybe that, but I try not to have too many regrets. I just try to learn from my mistakes. Hey. For me, it would, it would have been, I, I really didn't, I was not a serious person. I said I wasn't a top student in high school. That's because I was screwing around a lot. Uh, same for being an a, a undergrad student at Texas A&M. That, that dream of flying in space, these delusions of grandeur and stuff, they were buried. And so I horsed around a lot, uh, you know, and uh, I was not a serious student. 
I did enough to get by, but I wasn't, you know, I was kind of flying under the radar. And it wasn't until I really believed that the astronaut thing was possible. And a specific, you know, astronaut, uh, Ellison Onizuka, um, pulled me aside. And uh, my, my career was circuitous. So in the Air Force, right after graduate school, right after a and I went to grad school. Then I convinced the Air Force to send me to NASA. So I worked STS-3, the third shuttle mission, was the first one that I worked in mission control. And my office was just down the hall from the astronauts. And so I got to know them as people. And I found out that they're, they're not gods or something. They're normal people with an outrageous job. And there were two of them in particular, Jerry Ross and Ellison Onizuka, that were Air Force officers with an engineering background that had gone to test pilot school. And they both talked to me uh, about it. But I remember very distinctly sitting down with Ellison one day. And he said, you know, you could have my job someday. And I remember a bolt of electricity, a jolt of electricity just going through my body as he, like, oh, my God, an astronaut just told me I could be an astronaut. And, uh, and so now I'm really tuned in and I'm listening. And he says, you need to go to, air, you need to, go to test pilot school. And, uh, and you need to do really well. And you need, the second thing he said was, you need to quit screwing around so much. Ouch. That hurt, because he, he, he knew me. My office was two doors down from him. And he'd see me at, at, at parties and stuff. And that, that really caused me to believe in myself for the first time, really. And that, that's what flipped a switch in me. And that's what I, I said And when I went to test pilot school. I believed it was because somebody believed in me. It was Ellison Onizuka who believed in me. And, and so when I went, I was, I was just lit up with passion. I would say I'm on fire, but I was going to test pilot school, and you don't want to be on fire there. So, it, it, and so I put everything I had into that, and that's when I, I really was reaching hard, got the top grad, the top job, and I, I never had a chance to thank Ellison for that because less than two months after I graduated, he died in the Challenger accident when he and his uh, six other crewmates were just, were killed during launch. And that, you know, has been really, a, a, you know, I never got to thank him. His, his wife, his widow, is, uh, is, remains a good friend of mine today. But I, I continue to try to live up to that, expect, that high expectation he had of me. I was able to achieve that because he really believed in me. There's others along the way, too. But it really, that one is really poignant and really sticks because that's what made me kind of changed my ways and uh, I, I never, well, changed my ways and really, and, and, and I, I ran my, my throttles up to full afterburner and I've been there ever since because I believe and I know that you can achieve great things when you believe. For me it was, I wish I would have dreamed bigger a little earlier on. Um, I wish when I was started high school I would have known about stars or just different people here at home who actually want to help you and who want to guide you and who want to mentor you. Um, I feel like I could have done a lot more when I was here with you guys at Pace. Um, and also just being able to help others. That's probably the best part about all of it. But I wish I would have started earlier. And you guys are in a great position to do that right now. And I don't really have a really good answer. Actually, mine's I think is a little boring. Um, but I would honestly say I really wouldn't change a whole lot about what I've done. I know, you know, when I was in your situation in high school, I didn't know what I was doing or what I really, really wanted to do. I felt like everybody around me had their stuff together. And now, you know, looking back, I feel like I really did have it figured out kind of sort of all along. So. Nobody really knows what they're doing. <laughs> everyone's just kind of, I think everyone's just kind of going their own path. And at the end of the day, you'll be where you need to be and just follow your path. If you have a passion, work hard for it and you'll get there. I guarantee it. All right. Is there anything you all want to say to before we end? Before we finish this off? Any closing remarks? Yeah. I, that, that's, that's actually perfect. You can do amazing things. 
And I'm not just talking to the students here. I'm talking to all of the so-called adults in the room, too. You can still do amazing things if you believe and you're willing to work hard enough you can achieve just about anything. It might not be exactly what you were aiming for or thought you wanted to do, because goals change, adjust through the years and stuff, but it's, it's never too late to make a difference. It's never too, make, too late to make a difference in a young person's life that helps them believe, believe enough to stay the course, to recover from setbacks, and you can do amazing things. They laughed at me. Well, I did it. And now I wanted to help. I, I was, we were landing on the moon when I was a kid, and I dreamed about putting the first footprints on Mars. Well, that's not likely now. You know, I want to see those first footprints on Mars, though. And it's more likely some of you that are going to either put them there or help put them there. At, or, but whatever it is that you want to do to make a difference, have the confidence, figure it out. A dream is just a floaty thing turn it into a goal with things to do. You won't have to know each one. Just keep leaning forward. If you lean forward hard enough, you have to take a step. You know what I'm talking about? Lean forward. More, 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 more. Either that or you fall on your face and nobody wants to break their nose. But once you've taken that first step, you've started motion. Now you adjust your path a little bit and keep going. Keep leaning forward. You can do amazing things. There is no limit. Thank you. There's also, you know, STEM has always been a, a very big thing, but now there's also STEAM, and so we don't want anybody to be left out. Yeah, STEAM. So I think Cooper wanted to say just a couple words about the art industry. So this is kind of unplanned, but uh, so I know there's, you know, science, engineering, math can be pretty daunting, and for some people that's not what you're passionate about. You know, there's art, there's art, there's there's so many other avenues that you can affect this industry in. Like those cameras, that battery that's powering that camera, those were used to film the first Starship flight test. You know, like this is this is something that has changed my life, and I think you guys already touched very well on it. It's like you have these questions that you just there's something you got to find, something you're super interested in, and I found that if you kind of go down those pathways and you allow that curiosity to bloom, I mean, it can lead you on a lifetime of an adventure. You know, I'm from Southwest Missouri. This is a long way from home. You know, it's, it's, it's a long way from home, and uh, I just found, you know, I decided to ask this question, I decided to care enough to, about the answer, and it's led, on, it's led me on a three-year adventure so far, and uh, we're basically making the documentary on the return to space, and you just never know what can happen if you are willing to care about the answer to your question. So. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, And as he wraps up, I will add to that, think about STEAM, because if you go to the National Science Foundation and you look along the walls of the National Science Foundation, we always think about those who are those science geeks. What they have on the walls are beautiful illustrations, photographs, drawings of things that they have turned into those ways to communicate. Look at what's going on here. We have all of our media services. You saw those beautiful videos and information. Colonel Fossum's fantastic images. That's how we communicate. And y'all may not be the ones who are going to be flying on a space shuttle. You may not be the ones who are actually out there risking your lives. But it's really important to think about where do you fit into that big picture? What can you do that supports things? And if you're a fantastic illustrator, if you're great at the mathematics, you don't have to. Our engineers have to do engineering drawings. Otherwise, we don't have the diagrams and the information for him to be able to study in the classroom to be able to turn that into those actual mechanical devices or electronic devices to move forward. What do you communicate with now? You have your computers, and you have those passions to look at and to see how you can create images so people can fulfill their dreams. So think about those different things. Yes, STEAM is more important sometimes now, I think, than ever than just STEM. Because if you stick strictly to the engineering and math, you may not ever be able to communicate clearly to all your friends, 
family, peers, or have these great pictures. And don't disappear on us after he finishes his closing remarks because we do want to get a picture with all of our folks to post on our website. Kind of the reverse selfie, if you don't mind. So thank you all for being here. Just on behalf of uh, STARS, I'd like, to, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. But special thank you to Shelly Canwright. She is uh, the, at the NASA Office of STEM Engagement, and she's been a, a really big advocate for us the past couple of years, helping us get opportunities like this. Uh, thank you to Pace Principal Marisol Trevino. Thank you to Lisa Howell. Thank you to the KBSD crew back there recording. Thank you uh, to Ashley Science and Miss Science. Thank you to Melissa Hernandez and, of course, Dr. Ronnie Renfro. Victor, before our students leave, can, can we get a picture with all of this? I'd like to shake a hand for all the students that asked a question and stuff, too. Oh, okay, great. But I need the PACE students, if you will carefully advance to the stage and stand behind all of this group. Okay, our PACE students, and that's 